Welcome to ACT Twitter Space Unfolding Truth, the ultimate guide to trading. Watch until the very end and take the first step towards achieving your trading goals. Let's go. Good evening, folks. Hope everybody's doing well. So we're going to be talking a little bit about some unfolding truths. So obviously we had uh, two live sessions this week in a week that had FOMC, which is behind us now. Last day of trading tomorrow for the week. And ICT will be away from that, at least from the social media perspective. I'll be working with my son in private tutoring. <laughs> so I kind of like want to talk a little bit about something. I saw, uh, I think it was a, a thread other people were replying to, and someone had added my handle on Twitter to it. Something to, to the effect that uh, a viewer that still follows me on Twitter mentioned that the the best thing in the world they could have done was, you know, stop adding all the, the ICT stuff to their analysis and such. And it became a lot easier for them. And my takeaway from that is they stopped putting everything I talk about in their analysis. And I've said this many times, you know, in the lectures, I've talked about how I have a lot of tools, I have a lot of concepts and processes, but not all of them are applicable. And over time, you'll see the ones that meet the criteria that you want to adopt for your model, for your approach to trading. And not all of the tools that I implement and teach and present to all of you are going to be useful to all of you. They won't resonate with you. And I've made that very candid point multiple times. So when I see that and, you know, people come behind it and they'll say, yeah, this is, this is, you're spitting facts. This is nothing but truth. It's a truth bomb. Um, some of the replies were like, yeah, I can't get it to work for me. How long have you been doing it? I've only been doing it for two months. Okay. Well, there's your answer. <laughs> the, uh, the things I want to talk about tonight are simple truths that I'm showcasing. I'm doing it daily with you either in Twitter or now the live streams. And it's basically, you know, be pulling back on the information that I've already talked about in my lectures. So now you're getting to see it live. So there's no argument now. There's no question whether or not it's actually happening in the marketplace because we were able to sit here as a community live over the charts and it happens to script on the time that it's supposed to happen. So when we look at the marketplace and we're looking for opportunities, I want you to take a, a second to kind of like put everything down in your mind that you try to reach for using my concepts or other analysis concepts. And the simplicity that's available to you, but you yourself are complicating because I'm teaching various tools, but I'm not stating that these tools are applicable at all times, all time frames, every asset class. There's certain things that are useful that are not useful in other times. And in that thread that I saw, the, the person that was creating it mentioned that you know they stopped trying to put everything on every PD array. Well, not every PD array is in every fractal of price action. Not every single one of my PD arrays are in any one given fractal and price action. So in other words, if we were to randomly scroll through any particular market, someone could call out a market and then someone else could call out a time frame, and then I load the chart up and scroll through randomly wherever it stops, the first you know, 45 minutes of, of data, you want know, a lower time frame say, okay, that's the, that's the segment of price action we're gonna look at. So everything would be randomized. Not every single one of my PD arrays would exist in that fractal. But the ones 
that do exist and reside in that price action inside that market structure, they're pertinent. That means it's something that you need to be considering. Whether or not you use it to trade with or enter matters not. Because you understand, hopefully by now, that when I'm doing pyramiding, when I'm doing multiple entries into the same general trade, but I'm just building the position larger. For instance, you usually see me go in with six contracts, then three, and then a final for a 10 lot. If I'm really aggressive, I'll do six, four, three, two, one. Is it all the time? No. But I'm utilizing every available PD array. So that way you can look at the examples I'm using. That would be a pyramid entry. That could be an individual standalone entry. And the other ones prior to that one may not fit you. So when I do these examples, it's meant for your edification. So that way you can see which one resonates with you. I don't need to do a pyramid. I can just do one full pull and all in at one time and go all out at the terminus. But when I'm showing you the examples, I'm teaching you by example, real time, by going in, executing on live data, every possible pyramiding entry. That way you can see what they look like. Unfortunately, as some of the viewers and, and students that are casual viewers really not trying to learn, they're looking at the pyramid examples and focusing on what would have been profitable in terms of the money. And it's a, that's unfortunate, but you know, I want to try to show how you can take a equity base and run it up using the tools, the money management, the trade management, all those things coming together and how you can really parlay any equity size up to in enormous heights. Now, you aren't going to be able to do that right away. Someone in their first year isn't going to be able to do that. It's going to take some time looking at things. But what I want you to focus on is when I do those examples, and they're always made public, to look at each one of them in terms of where I entered, what pyramid entry did I do, what was it based on? Study it. Whatever one of the PD arrays I'm using in that example, does it jump off the chart where it says, oh, well, this is this is the one I always look for? Because sometimes I'll see students, they'll say, I got that trade, but I only used your second or third entry. I know what they mean, and they're doing it correctly. They're not trying to count gains that was made on that paper trade. I'm not trying to inspire you with paper trading equity. I'm trying to inspire you to determine which one of the PD arrays are most important to you because you're going to start with one of them. It doesn't mean it's going to be the last one for you or the one you're going to settle in on, but it's going to be the one you do the most work with until you find some continuity in reading price. And then you'll grow into maybe another PD array. They may not be breakers initially. It may not be the fair value gap initially. Unfortunately, I feel like I'm funneling you all into this fair value gap idea. And if I was being 100% honest with you, I am in a lot of ways trying to because it's easy to see. It's visual. And when we look at price, hopefully by now, uh, even the newer viewers and memberships to this community now can see that price is not random. If you think price is random, you know, that, that to me shows me that you haven't been really paying attention. You're not listening. You're not looking at the examples, the executions, my students' executions. They're doing things that you see me teach from beginning to end. And I'm inspired and I'm thankful that they've put the work in and they're showing their own individual community, the people that follow their YouTube channel or their social media accounts. 
And that feels good as a mentor because it's transferable knowledge. But just as well as price is not random, the manipulation that occurs in these markets is in fact very real. And sometimes we can predict when that's going to occur. Not all the time, but most times. And when we have weeks like FOMC we had this week, and when we have CPI and we have non-farm payroll, we have to adjust and adapt to the likelihood of unfavorable conditions for a short period of time. That is an unfolding market truth. It happens all the time. There's no ambiguity to it. It is absolutely something that repeats. But when there's no likely manipulation that comes by way of a high impact news driver like FOMC rate announcements or non farm payroll or CPI, then we're more likely to see a medium or high impact news driver provide low resistance liquidity runs which is the hallmark to what I teach as a mentor. Now, you see me engaging in high resistance conditions. That means I'm looking at markets that I generally would shy away from, not because I can't win, but because it's too much babysitting. And I may have to mitigate something that I did that didn't pan out well. I had that today. No harm, no foul. First trade out the gate, boom, no problem, done. I explained where the buy side was. I told you where the order block would be, and boom, took off. So that padded me out. Then I tried to build in a position, forcing an idea that I would otherwise try to do in another condition, not after FOMC the following morning. And it turned on me. Even though I tried to pyramid it and build it up, it stopped. Yeah. No big deal. I said, okay, I'm going to reverse. That's not chasing, folks. Because if it's showing the willingness to not want to go lower, and we saw today the new week opening gap was offering support. I wanted to see it trade below it and offer resistance and then displace lower. And I was trading with that idea in mind. It ripped higher. Okay, no problem. I'm wrong. Stop me out. So now it's hanging around a mitigation block, not a breaker, a mitigation block. So I used that to get in. It rallied up after me telling you that it was going to go to that 4026 and a quarter. I think it was 4026 and a quarter, 4026 and a half. I don't recall, but I know it's 426 to 4028. And I told you it was a five minute gap. That you know, it was basically hinging on, and it blew up right up there, bang. That na that navigation, that turning on a dime, that comes with experience. You don't understand that when you're new. It feels like, oh well, it's revenge. I saw a couple of guys. They said, "Well, you just revenge trading." No, that was not revenge trading. Number one, I did significantly less contracts after getting stopped out. And between the first win, the loss in that final portion, going up into that 4026 level, and the five minute fair value gap, no drawdown. So that frees me up to do what? Trade really where I want to be at in the afternoon. On FOMC, the day after, in the morning, all I'm doing is observing. I want to see what they're setting up for the afternoon. I wanted to see it trade back down in that opening range gap. But they just kept pushing and pushing and pushing all the way up into that five-minute SIBI that it's framed around that four, uh, 40, let me see what I'm doing here. Forty thirty nine and a quarter, and you can find that on your five minute chart of ES for the June contract. I told you to mention that in your 
annotations on your chart and the fair value gap around the 4026, 4028 level, all five minute basis. So eventually the market started to peter out and trade softer. And I gave you a imbalance with a dealing range. It was that blue shaded fair value gap. And so I want to see it draw down in there after the lunch begins. It's noon time. Okay. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in this discussion and why it's important to think like these protocols put you in front of your charts looking for these signatures to repeat, to, to come into the marketplace. So you're not reacting to price. You're anticipating. Now, one could say, oh, well, you know, didn't you react to price when you reversed? And to a neophyte, that would look like chasing price or revenge trading. Revenge trading would have been doing the same amount or not that, but more contracts going long and reversing. That's revenge trading. I know it well. <laughs> I did it a lot when I was a young man. But expecting it to trade back down into that opening range gap. Remember the shaded area? It was like an orange or tan colored rectangle that I was drawing out this morning. Using the regular trading hours, yesterday's settlement price, closing price, to where we opened up at today's trading on regular trading hours. It's that gap in between. So that's opening range gap. That's not new day opening gap. That's the difference between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. But those imbalances that are created with the opening range gap, it sets the tone for how we can trade intraday. So we can go into the marketplace anticipating a certain measure of symmetry in price. And when there's a lack of symmetry, meaning the indices are doing Opposite things. They're not in agreement. One's going up a little bit. One's going down. One's just doing whatever it wants to do. That's not a symmetrical market. And we want to operate in a market that is just like this. This is for your notes, folks. If you're not writing this stuff down, I promise you, you will not remember this. You're not going to remember it. And it'll be a waste of time sitting here listening to me just blow beat about something. I know how to do. My students that have been taking notes, they know this. But those of you that don't, you need to take this and transpose it into your journal. But you have to anticipate this likelihood of a disparity between where we closed the previous day and where we're going to open up at 930. Now, obviously, you can forecast it because the markets are trading electronically. And you can see, OK, we're going to be opening up with a gap higher or, or lower. But you're not going to immediately sell short expecting that gap to fill immediately. You have to anticipate some measure of continuation. What does that mean? Well, when we're looking at price, we know that it's not random. We know that manipulation is real. We know we can pretty much time majority of the manipulation. But we also understand that liquidity is a visible property in analysis. We don't need some kind of application, okay, like depth of market. Um, there's a lot of names for all these things out there. And I understand that they may be useful to other folks, but I'm trying to teach you how to trade naked where there's no indicators, no reliance on some subscription service thing, no indicator-based idea. You don't need those things. And because liquidity is visible, meaning above old highs, it's it goes without saying. If you look at a, a, a book map or uh, the ladders on depth of market, level two data, um, you're going to see numbers right above what you can see on your chart that would be an old high. How many times do you need to see that and know that, well, it's obvious. I mean, above that high, if the market has pulled away from that high recently, then there's liquidity above that. What kind of liquidity would that be? It would be buy side liquidity, buy stops. 
someone's utilizing that area to potentially enter on a breakout going higher because they're bullish or someone's utilizing that area to protect a short position and shorts are protected with a protective buy stop. And we're not trying to differentiate or get the ratio of what amount of buying on a breakout or buying a short covering exit. We don't care about that. We just know that that's a market truth above old highs or a singular high. We are anticipating that there is going to be a draw to that eventually because there's liquidity there and it's visible. We can see it. That high is going to have liquidity above it. It's, it goes without saying. Just as well as we can see that visually in price with old highs and old lows, because old lows, we would have sell side below that. Whether it be a singular swing low, an old low, or relatively equal or multiple lows, we know that below that is going to be a pool of liquidity in the form of sell stops, which we dub sell side liquidity. We don't need any indicator. We don't need a heat map thing, you know, whatever, these, whatever these individuals that like to have all these tools and things. It makes you feel like you're, you're high tech. I understand. I wanted to be like that when I was younger. I wanted to have every gizmo that was out there because I felt like if someone were able to see my charts, they would be impressed. Look at what he's got. Look what he's got on his chart. Whoa. Wow. Look at all that. Look at those GAN fans. <laughs> I had all that stuff on there. It was nuts. But just as well as we can see the liquidity above and below swing highs and lows, and that's not rocket science, but it's amazing how people don't utilize that in their trading. They adopt some relief of, in my opinion, uh, not relief, why did I say relief? It's some kind of a religious approach to an indicator. There's more emphasis on an indicator or an overlay of some kind than simply reading the chart itself and understanding where orders would be. So if we were to ask the question like this, is it more likely that a Gartley pattern, which is a harmonic pattern, it's pretty simple stuff, um, but some bullish Gartley pattern, is it more likely that the market's going to go up because the market traded into a Gartley pattern that would be bullish and going to its pattern target or is it more likely the fact that we traded down and there is a higher time frame order flow that's bullish and it's clear that we had some manipulation on the downside and sell side has been taken then we're going to be looking for a counterparty to do what look for buy side it's the second the market's not aware of harmonics it doesn't matter there's no there's no identification for that reference point in the algorithm. It is seeking where obvious levels of liquidity would rest. And if it's not doing that, it's doing what? It's seeking inefficiencies. That means fair value gaps, SIBIs, BISIs, something to that effect. Volume imbalances. So the market can see that. It can see old highs and old lows. It cannot see the number of orders above old highs. It cannot see the number of orders below old lows. It doesn't need to know that. Because human psychology, we're all being manipulated in the beginning when we first start trading. We all drink from the same tainted well. Put your stop above this old high. Put your stop below this old low. Buy on a breakout, sell on a breakout. Break and retest. Where's your stop going to go? Most recent swing higher, most recent swing low. That's neophyte 101, how to lose money. And that's why the statistics are what they are. Because you're all doing what I did too. Everybody that comes in this industry, if you buy a book or borrow a book or someone teaches you from a book, you're getting misinformation and it's not it's not fun to realize that later on and sometimes you like i did i wrestled with it 
I didn't want to let go of it. I was like, I, I'm just doing it wrong. I got to do it more. I got I to trade harder. I got to push my edge and make it sharper. I haven't been trading enough. I just got to keep pushing. My stops are too tight. I got to make them wider. Don't use one. That's even better. <laughs> and all of it resulted in blown accounts. So I know what it feels like to fall victim to all this stuff. And what took place in my understanding about price action that prevented me from doing those things again. And it's the understanding and the market truth of how markets seek liquidity above old highs, below old lows. And if it's not doing that, it's going up into a premium to reprice to an inefficiency where price created a stibby, where it's only a, a down move. And it's going to reprice back up to that level again. Now, because those are the two most important pillars of understanding bias and narrative, it's very important you spend the majority of your time studying old price moves with that in mind, going through your charts, annotating who got hurt here, who was being targeted here. Meaning, you go through your charts and say, okay, at this price run here in today, on the morning session, whether it's Forex or whether it's futures, you're going to map out the chart with as much detail as you want to put in. But the better amount is try to be as detailed as you possibly can, way beyond it would be necessary for you to take a trade because you're teaching yourself how to read what took place. You're placing, with the benefit of hindsight, looking at it, you're placing a narrative on what clearly took place. And by doing that for weeks and months while learning how to read the draw on liquidity, read the tape, you're doing exercises in hindsight and you're watching me call it live and you're watching me outline it in live streams live. You're getting a complete understanding. You're doing drills and exercises by you going into the charts yourself. And then you're watching real time. You're hearing me. You're watching me point out things real time. And you're seeing things, whether you realize it right now or not, but you're seeing things repeat. And your understanding is growing. It may not be exponential right now. It may be very marginal, but it's increasing. And over time, your subconscious is going to be gleaming more and more each time that I'm doing it live. And you're going to remember, oh, it's like those 50 other times I saw that in my back testing and where I'm annotating and logging. I see that it's there. That's, that's my thing. That's the thing I'm looking for. That's the model that your eye is going to jump to. Every single time the market creates it, your eye will go right to it. And you won't be looking for it. It's just your eye goes right to it. Boom, there it is, which is why I like to teach with the fair value gap. It's very easy to see it in the chart. It just stands out. It sticks out like a sore thumb. Markets reaching to liquidity or reaching to inefficiency with the purpose in mind to reprice and rebalance that inefficiency. That is what we use for directional bias. But the narrative that's required that would deliver that up move or down move hinges on time. So there's, there's three factors here now. We're repricing for liquidity, repricing for inefficiency in, with the purpose of rebalancing. And all of that is delivered by a basis of time. We're not surprised, okay? We're not surprised when moves happen. We're not like, holy crow, look at that. Where did that come from? Who saw that coming, folks? Let me get on social media. Hey, did you just see what happened on the British pound? What just happened? I don't know. Let's ask, let's ask ICT. <laughs> I don't know. I'm looking at, yes, I ain't looking at pound. So why I am not, and my students are not surprised, is because we understand the time aspects intraday. We know that there are certain signatures that tend to repeat. And you hear me talking about them all the time, whether it's in tweets or in live streams. 
in its macros. Macros are these little time windows when these subtle nuances come into price delivery and the market will start running. Now, you have never paid that much attention to it because you were never told to look for it, which is the reason why it goes underneath everybody's radar. But now, with me telling you, this is what's going on, your eyes keyed up, your reticular activating system is now dialed in on these specific times of the day. What times of the day are they? Well, I, I taught you that's 9.50 to 10.10, 10, that's one. 10.50 to 11.10, that's another one. That 3.15 to 3.45 in the last hour of trading, that's one of them. There are certain processes, little lists of orders, which is a macro. It starts to activate at these times. And looking at how the market is being delivered that particular session, that particular day, that particular week, we can anticipate a great deal of expected delivery in price where it's not guaranteed. Uh, nothing's ever, never really guaranteed, which is the reason why I promote and teach that you have to use a stop loss all the time. But I leave it to the viewer and my students to evaluate whether or not there's any efficacy to what it is I'm teaching. And with enough time, most people come around and say, well, yeah, this is no doubt now. It's obvious. It's, it's here it is. And now you're seeing it with me calling every one minute candle, explaining why it should do this and why it should do that. If there is no algorithm, if there is no control mechanism that's delivering price, then there would be no way for me to consistently be able to do what I'm doing. It would be completely randomized. My results would be what? Falling short, 50-50, right? The things I tweet about, I'm taking your attention into a specific PD array. That PD array may be eventually an inversion level, the inversion of what would be normally expected, a bullish breaker. Okay, well, what happens if it trades below it? That bullish breaker may act as resistance now, which would fly in the face of what the introductory lessons on my YouTube channel state. But what's happening? There's a change in the state of delivery. Oh. See, those down-closed candles that you know about as my order block, it's not the down-closed candle itself. It's the flipping from its opening price. And once it crosses that, that's the change in the state of delivery. What's occurring there? The algorithm changes from sell side to buy side. And any retracement back down into that opening price is just simply like a return to resistance broken, now turn support. But it's not seen that way because it's not classic support and resistance. It's not supply and demand. Because we're not dealing with zones. I'm dealing with a very specific price level. Within a context that's not ambiguous, is very specific. And there are elements that are drawn together that make a model. And we'll talk about that as we go. But just like a down close candle when it's got a fair value gap in the market's bullish and it trades down into it, and touches that opening price of the down close candle, that's a bullish order block. That's a change in the state of delivery. Well, if you have a bullish breaker and the market trades down below it and it fails to get above it or support it, and it trades back up into it, what's happening right here? None of you are going to look at that because I didn't teach that on my YouTube channel. You're not going to see that as an entry. You're going to be waiting for it to do what? Go up above it. Come back down and touch it and like a springboard, trampoline. Send it higher. It can do that. But if you don't pick up on the subtle changes in order flow where now it's not likely to do that. What is it doing? It's returning back to that order block, which is a breaker. 
and it's a change in the state of delivery. Now, once it gets back to those inversion levels, because it could be a breaker, it could be a mitigation block. You've seen me use the fair value gap. And when I call out a fair value gap on Twitter, the trolls would say, oh, look at that, it failed. They, not even knowing what I'm doing. I'm drawing your attention to it because it's going to become what? Inversion. We want to see it trade through it and then act as resistance or trade through it and act as support. When just simply understanding whatever I talked about as an introductory lesson on my YouTube channel or my core content lessons in paid mentorship, because that's all that was, was a language. People's out there making courses and, you know, look at this, I'm teaching you order blocks and so you don't know what an order block is. You have no idea what it is. You're going to learn by me pointing to these specific things real time, whether it be in tweets or in the live streams. There's a process that you submit to that allows you to be comfortable, not anxious. We're not worrying about something. We're not worried about missing a move. We're not, we're not worrying about any of that stuff. We're waiting for it to present itself. We're not reacting because we're already anticipating it. See, when you anticipate something, that means you have the foresight to know it's likely to occur. Let's go back to the live stream on Tuesday for a moment. That morning I told you, I said, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to go in here today. I'm going to talk about an entry. I'm going to push the button because there's people out there who say that ICT would never get on the live stream. He's never going to push a button. He's never going to do that because he'll fail because he can't cherry pick. He's got 17 laptops. And <laughs> my attention span is just this. Like, there's no way I could be looking at all these different monitors and keeping different, you know, setups and stuff. And TradingView is one account. That's it. So I sat out there and told you, I said, we're going to do one entry, one setup. And I want you to see what it's like to submit to one idea. But I'll tell you, there's other ones in here, but I won't take them. If you didn't really pick up on this, I want you to go watch the, the live stream on Tuesday. I did. It's not that long. It's like an hour long. You put it on twice the speed and I'll get you right through it inside of 30 minutes. I promise it'll be short and sweet. But I want you to listen to how I build you up with your expectations going in. That we're going to absolutely see the 2022 model. It's absolutely happening, which is exactly what I taught you when I was teaching it last year. It happens every day. It happens every day. Now, can you go out and say, my harmonic crab is going to happen every day? My harmonic unicorn. It might not be there. You're not going to have your harmonic bats in your belfry every single trading day. But, but, and this is something that you really need to grasp. And this is why when you, I listened to this, uh, this young man that was on, uh, I can't remember the company's name. And it's going to sound like I just don't want to represent him, but um, the guy that's the farmer and uh, he's a prop fund trader or whatever. He, uh, he was being interviewed about a guy from the company and he said that uh, they've done a lot of payouts with students from my fold and what they've learned from me. And he says, it's really interesting to see how the students that come from our fold, the lines then, <laughs> that uh, they have a strange sense of confidence that the other people that get payouts don't seem to have. And his words were, it just seems like we know and they know they got lucky. But you don't hear that from people that's trained with us. When you do it this way, we are absolutely confident. We know that we know. There's no ambiguity about whether or not we're going to see what we're waiting for. We know how to stalk. We know how to hunt. And we know how to take it down. And I was showing you that this Tuesday. I said, listen. There's going to be other opportunities in here I'm going to point out. Okay, I'm only interested in going short. 
I said, here's where it's going to run up here. It's going to go into the 28 level. That'll be five handles. I'm not interested in that. So there's one trade. I said, right now we're above this old high where buy side is. You know, this could be a turtle soup to trade down here. That's not what I'm going to take. I'm not interested in that. We're waiting for what? What did I say we were waiting for? We're waiting for displacement at the downside. Then a fair value gap to form. I'm going to sell short the fair value gap that forms and write it down into the sell side liquidity. And I'm going to try to do it with five handles. And then I said, you know what? It's just not like me to just do five handles. I always got to over deliver. So let's just go 10 handles. And then I showed you that there was two fair value gaps there. And then out of the 2022 model, out of the rules right out of the book of ICT in 2022, it says that if there's two fair value gaps, you have to allow for the market to trade up into the second one. So I was being a little bit more demanding on price action and being, being willing really to let it go without me if it didn't do it. But I wanted to wait and see if it trade up in that second fair value gap, the higher one. And I built the context around that bearish breaker. We can trade inside of the range of that breaker before it even really moves away from it. Once you understand the narrative, once you understand what it's likely to do, you can go in and do very, very refined entries. And I outlined that breaker. I outlined a fair value gap and the delay of trading view, because I mean, you can see me, I pushed a button and it didn't, it didn't execute. It was a, a wait and I even complained about it. I said, look, you saw me push the button and it was a delay with them filling me, which is fine. It's okay. But you're going to have that too sometimes. Your broker's going to give you a, a, a requote, maybe twice <laughs> sometimes, and you won't get the fill you want. That's going to happen. It's going to happen in the real world too, not just in paper trading. It's going to happen. But does it change the overall understanding of what you're looking for in that setup? It, if it doesn't, then it is what it is. You have to manage it now. You have to trade your way through that. And that is a market truth that you're not always going to get your best fill. You're going to get slippage. Does it change anything? If it doesn't fundamentally change anything, you submit to it. You don't get all nervous and freak out thinking, oh, no, this trade's going to be a loser. Look at all this. And you start obsessively compulsively thinking about what didn't happen for you favorably with your entry like I used to do as a 20 year old and then completely distract yourself from paying attention to what the price is doing and maybe giving you warning signs that you're no longer in a viable trade but you still hold on to it and didn't stop you out so you have to be careful with not making a mountain out of you know a molehill but I framed that breaker. I even explained that you know, it can go one tick above the breaker's high, which would be reasonable. And then I said it would go lower. And it was just beautiful. Beautiful. And it was just like I see 90% of the time. The things I talk about, I'm trying to show you that these things are repeating with a level of precision consistency and continuity that is outside the scope of what would be reasonable in this industry. And that should be encouraging. It should be very encouraging. And if it can be like that for me and it can be like that for my students, then it can be like that for you too. But you have to do what? You have to show up every day and you have to go through the motions like everybody else that's making big money with this stuff. They didn't learn it right away. They floundered with it. They hemmed and hauled and thought, oh, well, you know, I'm probably going to quit. Everybody feels like that once in a while. It's like exercising. You, you think you're going to get the 21-inch guns just because you started working out three weeks ago. But I'm drinking protein shakes. It takes time, man. And this is no different. It's actually, actually, it's way different. It's really harder because you're competing with your expectations that are many times unrealistic, which is the reason why I teach you to do very low-hanging fruit objectives. Five handles is easy, folks. Easy. How many times have you sat with a live stream and said, okay, it's going to do this. It's going to be five handles. Boom, it delivers it. Okay, it's going to go down here. Boom, that's going to be five handles. Five handles are all over the place. I mean, you could be making 20 handles a day in a market that ain't seeing sustained one-way runs of 20 handles. This is back and forth. It takes time to get there. Are you willing to give yourself that permission to develop over time?
because sometimes you aren't. Some of you listening haven't really given yourself permission to take the time that's required for you. You uniquely finding your own model, not trying to keep up with your friend on social media circle. The guy that put you into trading, you want to catch up to him or your girlfriend. It's been you know, starting the same time as you. She's understanding a little bit more and you're trying to keep up with her. That's not how you're supposed to be doing this. If you're competing with someone else outside of yourself, you're doing it improperly. And that's a market truth. You can't do those things and grow, well, at a normal growth rate without having performance anxiety, regret, remorse, because you can't keep up with someone else. I mean, you've seen me do many times several, several instances of over 100 handles, 80 handles, 50 handles, when the market's moving like that. But what am I teaching you? Am I saying go after those moves like that? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying go in, look for five handles. Because every session, every session, London, New York AM, lunchtime, New York PM session, all of them have an opportunity for you to go in there very, very easily and pull out five handles. Every single session. Every single one of them. Now, is that me inviting you to go out there and do that? No. It just shows you that you have an open field of opportunity where you can just go out there and take it by force when you know what you're looking for, how to anticipate it, how to stalk your prey, and know when it's going to show up. When you're a hunter, I can't help hunt. I just, I just can't bring myself to do it. I guess if I got hungry enough, I'd go out and kill something. Right? But hunters, they go out, they buy these... Uh, these trail cams and you put it up and they leave it out there for a week or so and then come back and download and see if there's any deers coming around and it tells them the time and the date and when they see them. So then they won't know what they have an inside advantage that they need to put their tree stand up, you know, hours before this thing usually comes through and they just wait around for it. Okay. Well, that same thing happens when you see what it is I'm teaching. I've already set these trail cams up. They're, they're windows in trading, the kill zones. I know the macros is going to happen. I know what the market's going to do. I know when the price is going to spool. I know what liquidity is going to reach for. And I'm not talking out of my ass because I'm proving it on Twitter, live in tweets that can't be augmented or changed. I'm not deleting anything. And you see it in the live streams. Live, right over to one minute candle. That should be building confidence in you. And I, I love seeing... The students that are seeing at the end of the live streams are like, I felt amazing watching that. I felt so comfortable watching how price was moving. And you would say it was going to do this. And it did it. And then you would expect it to do that. And it did it. And then it delivered the next thing you said. That is not randomness. That's not randomness. And it should be very comforting that you're in good hands. You're with somebody that has the ability to transfer this information to you. Just look around. There's people making lots of money with it. Does that mean you're going to go out and make lots of money with it too? Probably not. Because you're going to mess it up if you don't listen. We all do that. But you're growing in your understanding about it. And these elements of time, coupled with liquidity, coupled with inefficiencies and repricing to make them efficient, meaning a fair value gap gets repriced to. So it's no longer one candle holding all of that price action alone. It's now been fortified by a redelivery of opposing market delivery. So a down close candle, that's a fair value gap. We have an up candle trading up into that range. So now we have a repricing. And once it leaves that range and goes away from it, then it's rebalanced. What is it going to look for then? An opposing pool of liquidity or an opposing array that is inefficient that needs to be made efficient. How hard is that? That's not hard. It's very easy. It's, it's not complicated at all. What makes it complicated is you want to know the daily bias every single day flawlessly. That, that's, the, that's the hang up that most of my students have coming into me and, and asking me to teach them. 
If you could just teach me a real simple five minute video on how I can know the bias and I can do the rest. No, you'll lose money. You'll you'll lose money. You'll do it. You'll you'll go in there and you'll rush to get in or you'll wait for confirmation and it'll move too far and you'll try to use a stop loss that isn't reasonable. It's going to pull back in a normal retracement, stop you out, which would be a new buy signal. But you won't see that because you're now upset. And then it market runs away and you think, oh, this is crap. Nobody makes money with ICT concepts. When it's you rushing to do something that you don't know how to do. It's simple. But you don't want to see that. Just like I have students out there that are raising up pitchforks and torches. <laughs> We're going to get you ICT. Your shit don't work. Well, I got receipts that says otherwise. And I got people all around the world proving it does. And I'm doing live streams proving it does, and there it is. But you're going to be just like them if you don't listen to me. And I told them the same things I'm telling you right here. In those long, drawn-out lectures over live data, just like you watched me do today and just like you watched me do on Tuesday. And if you can't learn under those teaching lectures like that, I promise you, listen, okay, listen. I want you to understand how I don't need your ass to watch me. I don't need your ad revenue. I don't need you to support me on Twitter. I don't need any of that stuff. I'm here for the people that want to learn. But if you don't see value in the things I'm doing, in the amount of time I'm pouring into you, this is not ad revenue generated here. I'm talking to you with no monetization. And this is where the real shit is. This is where the real lecturing, the real mentoring, this is where it's at. Because I've already talked about those live stream things that I'm pointing at. That's already been explained to you. Some of you just need to see, can he really do it? Yes, of course I can. My students would have outed me years ago. I've every year I was saying, if I'm not calling these markets live right now, every day, behind my paywall, all my students come out here and tell you I'm a fraud, that I'm not calling it right. And it never happened. You know, I got more people signing up. And they found out that it was just like that. And you're seeing just what I was doing with them. And it's just like this. It's been like this for years. It didn't just start working. But some of you think that this now just started working or it's going to stop working because I have a lot of students. The algorithm's, they're going to change the algorithm, Michael. Here's the market truth. It ain't fucking changing. It's not. Oh, they're going to change the tier one, tier two. It's just not changing shit. It's not going to change anything. That's not changing anything. Trust me, okay? This stops working when you cannot trade, period. When they take trading away from us, sometime in the long distance future or maybe in the year, near future, I don't know, but there will be a time some nutcase will come out there and say, we're taking this from you. We're making it illegal for you to do it. It sounds far-fetched, but man, listen, the last three years, anything can happen now. They're saying ET is real. I was telling my private mentorship uh, group there this week for comedy relief. I said, the Pentagon came out and said that there's an alien mothership in our solar system sending probes to our planet. This is our Pentagon chief uh, UFO. Uh, person it's you know, they've made the person that's in charge of all that crap that's the that's the bullshit they're saying <laughs> that's science fiction stuff and i told you it was coming well here we are we're in it <laughs> man i could go on all kinds of rabbit trails and go off on a rant here but i'm gonna try to dial it back in you are got you're you're, you're gonna see by submitting and listening to these conversations because I want you to look at me not as your educator. I want you to look at me like your, your best friend in the marketplace. I'm the voice of reason for you. I'm the person that's trying to keep you on the right track, not over leverage, not risk, not gamble. Look for things that make sense and stay on the well-beaten trap, uh, the trail that I've forged for you. I've, I've, I've walked this path a lot. I know it. I can walk it blindfolded. You haven't. You don't know where the thorn bushes are. You don't know where that little root that sticks up in the ground that nobody else that knows about it would trip over, but I know where it's at. You don't know where the pitfalls are. You don't know where the poison ivy is. You don't know any of that stuff. So I'm lending you my experience through Twitter, calling out 
specific levels and watching what it should reach for. And I'm giving you those opportunities to have that epiphany, that moment of astonishment where you're like, oh man, I see this. This keeps happening. There's something to this. It can't be random, right? It's not. I've been telling you all that it's not random. But some of you have to have that experience before you ever put any work into it. Like, I don't have to do these live streams. I enjoy it. I don't have to do all this talking on Twitter and have my wife look at me all day long. Like, why are you on the phone still? <laughs> it's Twitter, honey. Look, see, here's what I'm doing. You talk to them too much. They're probably tired of hearing from you. I'm sure some of them are, but other people figure I'm not tweeting enough. So, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. I'm doing because I have to do it. You can turn the notification off if you don't want to hear from me. But if you can't find the value in me explaining it in detail, like the most recent uh, student of mine, Alex, he made a very good point. You know, if if I didn't know what I was talking about, I wouldn't have the volume of work that I have on YouTube. Like, and I'm not even done. <laughs> I, I have, shit, I have so much I could still teach on. It's ridiculous. But you don't constantly have to be learning new stuff to be profitable, which is the point of this discussion tonight. Unfolding truths. You you don't need much, but you need to know what it is that you're looking for. For instance, the opening range. That first 30 minutes of trading, trading the ES. ICT, why don't you talk about Forex? I don't want to talk about Forex right now. My attention's on futures. The things I'm teaching you work in Forex. So just take the information and apply it to Forex. Just like you all that trade crypto, you've heard me say, I'm not interested in crypto. And the ones that are very respectful said, okay, well, I'm not going to bother the man about it no more. I'm going to trade it, but you know, he's not going to do it. So I can't twist his arm and he's an old, old dog doesn't want to learn new tricks. And there it is. And you just filter it out. Well, I'm asking you that if you're a Forex trader, filter out the fact that I'm not talking about Forex. I'm still talking about Forex. I'm still telling you, you know, from a macro perspective, where it's, where the dollar is going to go, where's the pound going to go and the euro dollar is going. But I don't need to do it every single day because where I'm giving you analysis, it takes time for those big moves to pan out. That's swing trading models. So I'm giving you that approach where I don't have to babysit it every single day. And also by understanding that if I'm using market analysis concepts from a macro perspective, risk on, risk off. If ES is dropping or I'm expecting to be bearish, what do you think I'm expecting for the dollar index? It's going to go higher. Dave, if you're listening, you want to have the dollar index in your analysis, even when you're trading the ES, because market symmetry is perfect when it's like this. Dollar up, ES down, foreign currencies down. All lower lows and higher highs are confirmed across the board. That's market symmetry. As soon as you start seeing ES higher, Forex higher, and dollar not going lower, but consolidating, that means that you have a condition that's manipulation. That means that ES and or Forex can go up higher, higher high. And then the real move starts happening. So it's important to not just throw out the dollar index because you're watching two markets. It's important to understand how market symmetry aids the trader's perspective and analysis technique. Because there's a different degree of market delivery, whether it be high resistance, High resistance would be in conditions like where the dollar index is being held in consolidation. And you can still see Forex pairs going up, ES going up, but dollar fail to make the lower low. That means you have to trade that differently. What kind of environment is that? That's high resistance. You're going to have to go through something before you get your targets met. Versus a symmetrical market. See, these are the things you're supposed to be writing down. This is million dollar making stuff here, folks. Okay. I mean, I ain't going to bullshit you. This is the stuff that makes your trading superior to everybody else. But you don't realize it because 
you're not in these discussions taking notes and going into your chart saying, oh, wow. Man, he ain't lying. It's right there. Right. <laughs> yes. I'm leaving it to you to go into those price moves and see it. I'm not going to do all that work for you. I'm not convincing myself. I know this stuff. You need to be convinced of it. And it doesn't happen by me doing a video where I do all the work for you or condense it down to cliff notes like everybody else is asking for people. Hey, look, when you do his Twitter space on your YouTube channel, can you give me the transcript and the condensed version and the notes that you took during that? Because I really don't want to listen to it. He talks too much. He's full of shit. He does all these extra stuff. And I ain't got time for that. I got things to do. Right. You got things to do losing money. Okay. You got a real fast track on losing money. And then you're going to be down three months later saying ICT concepts don't work. Let me go over here and trade this Yahoo's stuff. You're the problem. I'm not. You are. Because I'm laying it out here. All of it. It's happening for free. And I'm proving it live. But you don't want to listen. Because you think you're too, you're, you're, your time's too valuable right now when this is an investment in yourself. I feel like you're worth it. I'm, I, listen, man, I, I don't need to do this stuff. Like, I don't need to do this. I'm not priming you for another mentorship run where I can get more money out of any of you. I'm doing this because I love This is my life. This is what I've been doing my entire life. I love this. I love teaching people how to do it. I love transforming people's lives and their mindset about who they are as a person and what they can accomplish. And if I believe that you're worth investing the time and energy in, why the fuck aren't you? Why don't you think that about yourself? No, 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 I ain't got time for that. Let me give me the, uh, you know, the commercial grade uh, five minute trainer version of this stuff. And then you wonder why you got dollar menu results. It's not because the concepts don't work. It's because you're half-assing it. You're using a half-ass mentor. Watered down Cliff Notes version of what I'm pouring out. Walking you through the logic. Why it should do this and why it shouldn't do that. There's, there's reasons for these things to be even talked about. And while you might not understand it. I don't like all these other PD arrays. Well, in the beginning, you got to know all of them. Doesn't mean you're going to use all of them, you know, going into your career. But you need to understand all of them until you settle in on the one you like. And what does that mean? What I did on Tuesday. I told you that we were going to rally up and take that 28 level out. And that's five handles. I don't want to buy it. It goes against what I wanted to do. Oh, okay. I told you we were above the old high. We were in buy side. It's going to sell off there. I don't want to take that as a short. I'm going to wait for the displacement. Okay, well, there's there's another trade right there. And then I told you we were waiting for the fair value gap. My mind was settled in on taking that trade. That's what it's like for you. You'll see all these PD arrays. You're not looking at and being distracted. Oh, we don't, I don't like breakers, but look at that breaker right there. And the whole time it's forming you know, institutional order flow entry drill, which we, might be your entry technique. That's your multiplier. That's your model. You're aware of the breaker, much like I used on Tuesday. That wasn't the entry criteria, but it was being utilized to show you how far it can retrace and not take out that high it made. Do you understand that? You can, can you draw the importance of knowing the PD arrays for that purpose alone? Now, the breaker in itself, if, if you weren't taught the fair value gap, you would have been using that breaker as an entry only after it moved away from it and then bumped the bottom of it. That's far less of a premium than where I entered it with the fair value gap, the second higher one. See the difference there? Now, some of you might feel like, I feel comfortable trading the breaker when it broke away from it and came back up and retested it. I'm used to seeing it. That's what I want to do because you're comfortable. Well, guess what? Don't let me change or anyone else talk you out of it. That's your model. Bloom where you're planted. But you can't just go out there and say, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know this model or any model really, but uh, it's, just, it's just too much stuff. I'm not going to do it. But then you're lazy. <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line. You're lazy. And I don't want to see people 
adding my handle on Twitter, talking shit like that. So I mute them. I'm not trying to block them so they will, they can't see anything I teach, but I just don't want to see that shit. So I hit mute and there it is. You can talk out your ass all you want, but you're doing it with a half-ass approach. And you're going to be that same person months down the road that will not find the results that other students of mine are doing and they're killing it. And you'll walk away thinking that, you know, this isn't all that wonderful. Move on down the road. Like I, I'm not here for you to worship me. I'm here to invest my time and energy into you and I can leave social media in November and not have to worry about it. Cause I know I've done more than enough. But that opening range, that first 30 minutes, how do we open in that? Are we opening with a premium? That means are we opening higher than where we closed in the regular session hours the day before? Or are we opening lower? If we're opening higher, it's a premium. Not in the sense that I'm teaching premium and discount for the PDRA matrix. It just means that we're opening with a gap higher, and that's a premium. Meaning that it's too expensive right now, and we have to see, does it have to finish a higher time frame price run, which is what we saw today, where the market opened at a premium, it rallied up, and traded to that 40.39 level, the five-minute fair value gap, the SUBI, which ended up being the high of the day. Market traded lower, and eventually went right into that opening range gap. So it went from opening in a premium at 9.30, trading higher, only to reach a higher time frame premium array and then sell off. Which brings in the idea of day of week and time of day. Today's Thursday, and we've seen it rally up this week. And Thursday tends to, not all the time, but tends to create the opposite end of the weekly range. So we can anticipate some likelihood of the market topping out and always going in anticipating some reason for it to do what? Trade softer, go lower. We saw that today. It rallied higher. And then ultimately gave up the ghost and went lower than it did yesterday after FOMC. Trading down into some random level. New week opening gap. Failed to get down to the new week opening gap low by a tick or two. But that's okay. That's close enough, right? Significant drop in the afternoon. When we started the, the live stream, I was outlining where I thought the market was going to go, what it shouldn't do, why it should gravitate lower. And I walked you through every single candle. This is what it should do. We don't want to see this, but it could spike up here, and that would be great because that would be knocking out trailed buy stops, and then it's probably going to have a really sudden drop. It didn't do that. It went just to the high of that opening range gap. Remember that orange or tan shaded rectangle I had in the live stream? It went right back up to that and then started selling off and then created what? Every up close candle, we're expecting it to do what? Repel price because it's what? Bear shoulder block. Every consequent encroachment of a wick high, treat that as what? A premium array. Go up there, does it repel price? Yes, it does. Volume imbalances. Is it going up there, repelling price? Yes. Can it trade through a volume imbalance? Come back down below and act as resistance? Yes. All this movement in price action was being explained to you. What's the next discount array? That fair value gap at 85. Trade it down into it. And then that tells you what? It's going to reach for the low of that opening range gap. Low. And it traded down into that. And I said, now if it goes there, it's going to reach into the new week opening gap high. And it did that. And I said, okay, we'll watch the consequent encroachment. Every time that I point to something, your job is to observe and pull in 
that experience? Do you feel anxious? Do you doubt that it's going to do it? What are you feeling? In the beginning, you want to have all your critical thoughts written out. And then over time, while you're building your model and you're back testing, you're not recording anxiety or stress driven annotations. You're recording the perspective that, that you knew it was going to happen. And you're tricking your brain with positive self-talk, which cancels out all of the necessary evils that come in in the beginning for a trader for them to want to quit. You're going to cancel that because you're feeding yourself positive self-talk. The move, you may not have seen it coming and you're looking at it in hindsight, but you're recording it in your journal like you did. And your subconscious retains that. And because you're seeing something that repeats because of the way it forms, fair value gaps and delivery to old lows and old highs and imbalances. When you're watching it live with me, and I have saw some people today, they were commenting, and it's not just today, I've seen it several times in the past when I was doing the live streams, that you're anticipating before I say what it is I'm saying. You're, you're already seeing it. And you're saying that it feels good that you're seeing it before I say it. That's exactly what you want to experience. In the beginning, you may not feel like that. And that's okay. That's why I'm doing the live streams. I want to teach you. I want to teach you by example with my ability to be able to do it real time with you. I'm comfortable doing it. I'm confident. I'm comfortable. I'm good at it. You're in good hands. I'm doing it enough. So that way you can go in and then do it on the days I'm not doing it and practice. Record what your observations are and not be emotionally strung out because it doesn't pan out like you want. Because you're going to have that in days where you're going to try to put a trade on and it's not going to move in your favor. And you're going to wrestle with that. And some of you are going to get angry. Some of you are going to be resentful and you're going to do something stupid. You're going to over leverage. You're going to trade too much and you're going to hurt your account or blow it, lose your funded account. And I'm trying to teach you how not to do those things, how to focus on times when you know it's going to be hard when I say it's going to be a high resistance liquidity run. Doesn't mean you can't move. It just means that it's going to be very, it's almost like the price is being argumentative. Yeah, it's going to go there. But it's going to be begrudgingly about it. I ain't going to. I don't want to go there, bub. <laughs> okay. I don't want to go to that buy side right when I want. When, when you want it, I don't want to do it. Then I'll do it on my own time. That's what it feels like when I try to personify what price action is doing. Like if I'm if I'm arguing internally with price, like why aren't you doing what I wanted to do? Why aren't you doing what? I, why aren't you submitting to what I know you should be doing right now? And I view it as it's arguing with me, saying, "Listen, you want me to do it, so therefore I'm not going to do it." Like my wife, can you do this? Look, I'll do it when I'm ready to do it. Well, there it is then, right? It's done. <laughs> Submit to the process, right? <laughs> so with price, in a low resistance liquidity, it's very, it's almost like it wants to do it before you ask it. it like you, it, it's, it's telegraphing. I'm going here. Everybody's stop is up here, okay? And I'm going to go up there for you. And I'm going to do it really fast because I don't want you to grow impatient, ICT. It's going, to, it's going to be so quick for you. All you have to do is to sit back and let me reach your limit order. I promise you, big guy, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take it right home. Boom, baby, I'm going to give it right to you. And that's what it feels like. It feels like Christmas morning. And that's what you're trained to see as my student, because there's a totally different experience trading those types of markets, those days, those sessions, where it just feels like, what the hell just happened? That was so easy. And here's the problem with it. This is the part where you write this down, okay? When you have these windfall victories in these low resistance liquidity run conditions, when you have that win, it's like, Man, that took like no effort at all. It was very fast. I got to go in here and do it again. That's the trap. That is the trap. When you have these easy windfall days, these goobers out there that like to sock puppet and troll people because they can't get attention, they'll tell you, you got to push your edge and don't take partials. 
got to go in here and do it again. And then lose what you made. If not all of it, some of it, which is stupid. You're throwing good money at you're throwing good money after bad. The point is the trade in these environments, get your easy wins and go home happy about it. We're not in this industry to do lots of trading. I took 15 freaking trades today and they were 12 wins out of 15, baby. Look at me. I'm an ace. Really? Um, I went in there and traded for 20 minutes, made your whole monthly salary, and I went out and started watching movies and playing with my kids in the park. And you're out here sweating, trying to get 15 trades and didn't even do half what I did. See a difference there? Everybody's perspective is skewed. Mine is, I want to go in when it makes the most sense to do it. I want to be in there, easy, in and out, bang, it's done. I want to be in the trades that run. Not just hang around. I'll get there when I get there, ICT. Just hold your britches. I don't like that. I like shit my way. They name streets after me one way. And I want my way. Okay. Some of you come to me, you want to have it your way mentorship. Like it's Burger King here. It ain't Burger King. We're not flipping fucking burgers. Okay. We're flipping accounts. Okay. We're, we're taking things to whole new levels here. And we want to go in when there's a jet pack behind our trade and just boom, it's gone. Now we're talking hyperspace. We're not wasting time, wondering when it's going to move. We know when it's going to move. We know how it's going to move. And it's going to be quick about it. Expedient delivery. That's what you're being trained to look for. You can't appreciate it or identify it until you see these types of conditions. You won't understand it. You won't see the difference. The characteristics are different. For instance... Look at how it traded this morning going up. It was a little lethargic for a little bit, and then boom, 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 ran up into that 40 level. Then it had a little bit of give and take back and forth as it was dropping down. And then once it got below that 4010 level, that new week opening gap, and then traded back up into the daily fair value gap, Sibby high. That was it. Then we entered into what? Low resistance liquidity run. Where's it going to reach for? Filling in that opening range gap. The difference between where we opened in the morning at 9.30 and where we closed in the regular session hours yesterday. And I walked you through it live in the afternoon. You can't appreciate it until you see both sides of it. And when I'm prompting you, I'll say, you want to log how you feel right now. Some of you think that that means go into your journal and bitch to yourself about how it's hard. No, you need to be saying price is being very fickle. It's being very, well, demanding of my patients. It's not delivering as fast as I would like to see it do. You see how that sounds versus this market sucks. This is chop city. This is garbage. This is trash market conditions, blah, blah, blah. How's that useful? It emotionalizes that experience where now you're viewing it subconsciously because you put that in your journal. Oh, this is trash. This is you know, garbage trading conditions. So now is that going to be a market environment that you're going to feel comfortable with? If you see a setup, you might see the setup. You might want to take the setup, but subconsciously, you don't realize it, but it's manifesting underneath the surface. In your psychology of how you're interpreting how that price is going to likely deliver, you're going to tap into that negative recording in your journal that you spiced up with negative reinforcements, trash market conditions, which means what? This is probably going to be scary. So subconsciously, you see the setup, yeah, but subconsciously you're thinking, man, I'm probably, I'm probably going to lose on this. This is probably really low probability. But you're going to try to wrestle with it, which means what now? You're in a trade or about to take a trade, and you're in, in a divided mind. You see a signal. You want to take the trade, but you've poisoned, tainted your subconscious. So now you have fear. 
You've invited, you engineered fear in your next trade because you recorded something in your journal or you posted something on social media. You had a conversation with somebody else that's trading and you said that you are, you suck as a trader. You're not able to get this stuff to work and you can't ever get it. And it's always failing on you, blah, blah, blah. You're reinforcing subconsciously that you're a loser. What do you think is going to happen when you start pushing the button? That's going to manifest itself in your actions. Just look at YouTubers out there that are toxic. They're doing it to themselves, trying to make themselves look better than me. And they're blowing their ass out right in front of everything and killing their entire brand. And all I'm doing is sitting back watching them do it. They're doing it to themselves, just like you're going to do it to yourself. If you do these things, you have to coach yourself. You have to cheerlead yourself. You have to pamper yourself in that journal. That journal is your love letter to yourself. That's the encouragement. That's the letter to your future self. These are the things that I have thought about for you. I'm planning all these things for you, your future self. You're writing all that to that person that you're developing into. But are you feeding that person positivity? Or are you choking it and strangling it with negativity? It's real important. And you might think that, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Journaling's for... Yeah, for the weak ones, I don't need a journal. I just go in here and I take my trades. I'm, I got a model. I got an edge and I got time to mess around with that journal stuff. I'm going to tell you that's a person that ain't making money consistently. I'm going to tell you that's a person that's going to be an emotional basket case while they're trading. They'll be highly emotional. Like if you listen to me talking, like uh, there's no difference between that and me reading a book about fishing. And I'm not a fisher. <laughs> like it would be the same thing. It's this guy's putting me to sleep, man. What the hell's going on? That's what it's like. When you know what you're doing, that's what it's like. And you want it to be that way. You don't want neon sight uh, lights and rave shit and music pumping around. Yeah, you know, and, and now it's emotional stimuli. No, 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 no. When you're learning, it needs to be boring. Now, when you get good, you know your model. You want to play some, you know, blasting music that gets you all fired up. You know, the ride of the Valkyries, <laughs> if that's your thing, right? Uh, whatever it is that gets your juices flowing, when you know which you're looking for and the model's there in the charts and you know you're in the right day and everything's lined up. Sure. Yeah, man. Like I, my, my speakers are blaring. Like I, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's my, my upstairs is pulsating. You know, I have a lot of sound coming out of my, but hey, you know, I, that's my thing. But I'm not telling you as a developing student to do that while you're studying it does it's counter it's counterproductive you want to bring yourself to a level of anticipation knowing that these things are likely to form when they're likely to form and how they're likely to form in a boring condition because you're you're not presenting any invitation for emotional stimuli which will be distracting in your early development you want to see every boring detail this is what this chart should be doing this is what this candle should do. It should not do these things. It should be allowed to do that, but not do this. Okay. And you're learning all that. And I can't write a book. Okay. I can't write a book that's going to say these in word, these things in words, and it make any sense to you. That's why when I mentor, I was doing live sessions and I was reading price to them, just like you're watching me. And I'm sure there was people today watching me do that. And they said, this, this guy didn't push a button. He didn't enter a trade. He's talking all this stuff and the market moved and he didn't do anything. I was teaching. I was teaching people how to submit themselves to price delivery. And I also talked about how when you're in a move, I guarantee you these people that are very critical, they're probably getting in there and getting three handles or getting six pips in a forex move, panicking the entire time, not realizing all the other move that's still in the in the price action because they're emotional. They're making everything a competition with themselves and everyone else. And everybody that's highly competitive, they're shitting themselves on so on social media. Just look around. None of them can carry themselves forward consistently. They're all wrecking themselves because 
They're trying to do something this industry is not meant to do. Compete. That's not what this is for. Look at that Robin's Cup. People are up on the leaderboard. They're falling off the leaderboard, getting real high and then falling off. It's a wonderful psychological experiment to watch how these people really push the envelope. And some of them are clearly gambling. And I don't want you to have that mentality. But what do you think would happen? Let's just play devil's advocate for a moment, okay? What do you think would happen if you got that position in your learning, that plateau of now you're, you're bored, you know what it's going to do, you know how it's going to deliver, you just got to wait around for it to happen, and then when it presents itself, you push the button, and it does what you thought it was going to do, and the results were expected, and it was delivered as such. What do you think happens when you start applying gaming theory and money management to something like that when you're no longer emotionally stimulate, uh, stimulated by the result, but you're now pushing the envelope with high precision, high strike rate, high accuracy, and now you have optimal F applied to your risk management. Hmm. You start seeing extrapolated increases in your equity, and you still don't have the emotions. You don't have the fear. You don't have any of that stuff. And when you place that against something other than what's normal in this industry, it rips it to shreds. Nothing comes close to that. It's breakneck velocity in terms of the equity increases. And contests are not even a contest. It's a clinic. Here's what you'll never be like. Here's what you'll never be able to obtain doing the Mickey Mouse shit you use. But you can't jump into that. You can't just jump into that league. There's a lot of things you have to do to prepare yourself. You have to completely desensitize yourself to the ebb and flow of your equity going up and down in a trade. And I talked about that today when we were live streaming. The reason why I've talked to you in these live streams the way I do and in these Twitter spaces because I want you to remember these discussions because when you're in a live trade and some of you probably have never been in a really profitable winning live trade with real money when it happens and if you're not sitting with a trade that has a limit order where you know where it's going to go you just you got in you don't know what it's going to do you are just giving it a chance to start moving around and it explodes in your favor out of blind luck and I say that facetiously, obviously, because if you're using the, what I'm teaching, it won't be blind luck. But it'll explode in your favor. And then you have this problem. It's running. Profits building constantly. And you're looking at it like a deer in headlights. You can't move. You're... You're paralyzed and you're watching the candle expand bigger and bigger and bigger and the profits growing faster and faster and faster. And you don't want to touch the stop loss, but you don't want to close the trade. But you're thinking, I should close the trade because I'm making so much money. What happens if it reverses? And it still keeps climbing. It still keeps building up. And you're all hopped up. And it feels like panic. That's one of the hardest positions to be in as a trader that's new. Because everything you do is going to be wrong. If you get out right now and it rips even more, you're wrong. If you don't get out and it retraces or reverses, you're wrong. If you stay in that position with no limit target placed and you don't trail your stop loss to lock in something, you're wrong. And that's what's happening at 100 mile an hour in your mind. All these things are zooming through. And you can't focus on any one thing. All of a sudden you have attention deficit disorder. <laughs> you didn't have it before, but you have it now, buddy. And it's a weird feeling when, it, when you encounter that. It's like, what the hell do I do? What do I do? And if your spouse is in the room and they start talking to you, shut up. Don't talk to me right now. I, I, look, don't you understand how hard this is? I told you I, I got to be focusing. 
Now, minutes ago, you're reading the fucking comic books, eating potato chips, clipping your fucking toenails. But now, because you're in this position where everything's flying at light speed, you're not losing money, you're making money, you have no idea what to do with it. And here's your spouse just saying hello to you, and you're tearing their fucking face off. Because you're that's one more thing that's competing for your attention. Because you didn't do what you're supposed to do. Have your model outlined. Where's your profit targets? Where's your partials? You have to be prepared for those types of things. And it's going to happen. You're going to just get in there one day and just see. This looks like it might move. Let me put it in here and not put your limit order in. Not put a partial in. Let's just see what happens. And boom. NASA. Rocket takes off. Boom. It's off. Off to the races. And then when it happens, you don't know what you're You're not supposed to. You won't, you won't know what you're supposed to be doing. Because it'll be moving too fast. And I guarantee you, whatever you do that moment. You're going to regret it later on. I wish I would have got out sooner. I wish I would have held on to it longer. I wish I would have moved my stop loss up more. I wish I just would have just sat still. And you're going to be flipping through all those decisions so fast. So fast. And you're going to be panicked. And... I'm holding these discussions with you because I want you to remember these things. When you're watching price, using the things I'm teaching, you're not going to be surprised. You're not going to have these. <gasps> Where'd that come from? <gasps> Why did that happen? Why did that happen? Let me go on Twitter, ask everybody else. Dude, what just happened? You don't ever hear me saying that. My students don't ever hear me saying that. In any of the mentoring I've ever done, over live streaming, when I was mentoring, behind the paywall, they never were like, whoa, where? Nope. We were anticipating everything. That's a different mindset. That's the truth. When you're here with us, we're training you to be a soldier that's war hardened we know what we're walking into we know bodies are going to be stacking up and we're doing the stacking we know that someone's losing their ass and it's on the other side of our trade we know our setup is coming what time of the day it's coming we know how it's going to form we're waiting to ambush it we know how to stalk our prey. We are not ambushed. We are not taken by surprise. We're not caught in a snare. We know exactly where we're placing our next step. We know the terrain. We've been here before. It's well mapped out. That's confidence. And to someone that's new, that's never been around us before, it sounds like fucking arrogance. And guess what? If you want to call it arrogance, fine. I'll own that. It's just me being around the block enough times to know I know my way around. And my students do too. It doesn't make us pieces of shit. It doesn't make us bad people. It just means that we know our shit. We know what we're doing. And these funded accounts and these companies, they're finding out. <laughs> they're finding out. We are built differently here. This is the Monster Lab. Okay. This is Monsters Incorporated. You come in here, you spend enough time, you're coming out a savage. Claws, fangs, everything. And you're going for your pound of flesh. And damn it, you're going home with that pound of flesh. When you have these opportunities to sit down and, and watch live price action with me, I want you to feel what it was like before you had these experiences where you were looking at the price action and just felt like, what am I supposed to do with all this? I'm tickled, honestly. When I read comments after the live stream, it's like, dude, what the hell? Like, it did everything you said I was going to do. Right. Now, I don't feel that way, but I'm 
amused when I see new students or people that's never spent time with us, their reaction to that. I love that. I take the Twitters or tweets rather, and I show my sons, I'll say, look at this. This is someone now. Right now, I have my hooks in them. They're never, ever, ever going to forget this. In that moment, they're going to hold on to that. And they're going to they're going to want to do it themselves. They're going to do whatever it is. They learn how to do that themselves because they see it as a superpower. And it is. We're fucking mutants here, man. We're not like the average traders. We look at things with a precision perspective. Discipline. We know what we're waiting for. We're not distracted. We're not taken by surprise. We're not looking at stupid shit that has nothing to do with what makes price go up and down. We're not worrying about fundamentals because fundamentally everything's in the technicals. Period. Like, what else do you want? What else do you need? Think about it. When you first started trading or got interested in trading, everything that you put your hands on, you know that the stuff that you were looking at just didn't make any damn sense. Like, yeah, I, I see what you're saying with these lines and stuff, doing this and doing that, but how do you know it's going to go there? Well, we really don't know. You just got to, you know, eat it if it's wrong. No, 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 no. I know what I'm looking to eat. It's fucking filet mignon. I'm pulling it off of somebody's ass in this market. They're going to lose to me. I know that going in every day. I know how to find that next victim in the marketplace. I know that. And you're being trained to do that too. And when you see everything else next to what it is that we do, nothing compares to it. It gives you confidence. It gives you clarity. You know what you're looking for. Think about it. You know exactly what you're looking for. It's going to run up to that liquidity or it's going to run up into what? In an efficiency. How do you know if it's going to go to buy side or in an efficiency, Michael? How do, you, how do you do that? Like, how do you know that? The, well, has it ran up above buy side recently and then broke down, but has yet to take out sell side into a discount? Then it's probably going to go up into an inefficient, inefficiency, a premium. And not run that high. It's already ran the stops. That's how I trust it. They've already went into the liquidity. Now they're just taking it into a premium to rebalance an inefficiency and then send it to the sell side. And then reverse the other way if you're bullish. It's going down for inefficiency or it's going down for sell side. It's going up for inefficiency or it's going up for buy side. If it ain't doing that, it's consolidation. Think about it, folks. You got three choices, up, down, or sideways. If it's sideways, well, the calendar is going to tell you when that's going to happen. When do we expect consolidations? I taught you that. So if it's not around those times, then we anticipate expansion. Which side of the market are we going to expand on? Which side is likely to be traded to because it's been taken into sell side or buy side? The market's going to move to the opposite range. Why? Because smart money is going to want to do offset distribution. If they're short because they've taken buy side, it's going to go down to a discount to inefficiency or sell side. Reverse it. See, it sounds complicated because you haven't been spending enough time with us. That's all. You haven't been watching price action. You haven't been seeing me outline it real time, telling you what it's going to do, why it's going to do it, what it isn't going to do, when it's supposed to do it. When you spend time in that environment, live over real-time data with me, it's easily to convince you there. But you're still going to, at the end of the day, walk away from the live stream thinking, wow, that was amazing sorcery. That was a magic trick. He's doing something. He can't. Nobody can do this. And then you start thinking about how you can't do that yet. You're impressed. You don't know quite how I did it, but you go right back to thinking, let me turn it against myself. Can I do that right now? Which is unrealistic. But then you start feeling bad. Like, oh, this is really this is really complicated. I want to see that in my own trading. I want to be able to do what Michael and his students are doing. 
but I can't do it right now. But I've watched six videos. I've been watch. I, I've been watching these videos. I've binge watched for the last three weeks, and I've put some things down on a notepad. I don't know. I don't know where the notepad really is, and I spilled coffee on it. And you know, <laughs> what do you expect from me? Organization, yes. Diligence, consistently showing up and taking it like a business. If you're just going to be willy nilly with it, then that's what you're going to get out of it. You're going to get what you put into this. If you treat it like you're learning the highest form of financial warfare, you're going to handle yourself differently. If you're thinking this is like the lottery and it's scratch offs, well, <laughs> come on. Of course, you're going to get Instagram results. Time of day and the signatures in the AM session, in the AM session run, they're going to be different than that of the PM session. And the benefit of knowing what that opening range gap is, if there is one, if we don't fill the gap in the morning session, we're going to expand till we get to a higher time frame PD array. Once we hit that, typically in the lunch hour, then during the lunch hour, we have some measure of retracement to morning session stops. Now, it can be exaggerated past that if we have not filled in that opening range gap, which is what we saw today. What do you think would happen if we saw this morning open, trade down, close in that opening range gap, then rally up going into the lunch hour? Any retracement lower on sell side would be what? Just to use to go higher in the afternoon because the unfinished business of that opening range gap had already been taken care of in the morning session. Oh, it sounds like narrative. Yes. Things are expected. If they don't deliver, that means something. It tells us how we are to anticipate the next session. The morning session after FOMC or the morning session after a large range day, we are willing to, to simply let it do what it wants to do. We're using it for intel. We're out there collecting intel. We're not engaging. We're on a, a, a clandestine mission where we're out there just observing how many victims are we going to stack up in the PM session? Where are we going to stack the bodies? That's where the liquidity is, the sell side. The new week opening gaps below the marketplace. The discount fair value gaps. We're mapping out all the terrain, where the sentries are, where the, the guards are, where's the strongholds. And then when the time comes and we get into that two o'clock hour, we release the hounds of hell and it's war. And you just watch price unfold like you've outlined it, which is what you watched me do today. It's amazing when you finally get to the point that you can do these things yourself. But all of the interviews I'm doing, and I have lots more of them, I've got another one I'm recording tomorrow, but it probably won't be up until Monday. Why not? Why not, ICT? I want to space them out a little bit. <laughs> it sounds like um, I'm filling my channel with just that. I got to put some teaching videos in between them. But when you have this uh, epiphany, this moment of clarity where you know, you know what it is that I'm training you to observe. When you finally get to that point where it makes perfect sense and you know exactly what you're looking for in price action without me having to say so, I cannot find words to fully articulate the level of fucking power and confidence that it gives you. 
And I'm sorry, I know some of you, like, oh, you, the language. Listen, listen, man, ma'am. We're talking about life-changing shit here. You can play Sunday school once you learn how to do it. You want to carry yourself differently? Sometimes I can't carry myself 100% stable. I go off the rails, and I'm fighting very, very hard to stay on right now. But when I feel what it felt like for me, and I know it's going to have the same impact on you, probably even worse, not worse in a bad way, but more, more impactful. Because you didn't go through six years of it. Some of you are just coming here. And in this a short span of time, you're already learning things that you were not aware that was even possible. I guarantee you if I did a poll and you were being honest, not to try to fluff me out because I don't want any of you doing that. But if I was to ask, how many of you are astonished to see that it is possible for someone to be able to call every minor fluctuation in the marketplace with that level of degree of precision. It was unfathomable in the beginning. Before you found me and anything like the things I'm teaching, you didn't think that was possible. I know I didn't. I just felt that there was people out there that would get more luckier than I was getting luckier on the few winning trades I had as a new student in the 20s, or not when I was in my 20s rather. And it's weird when you think about all of the things that you wrestle with in the beginning. Will I, will I be able to do this? How long will it take me? Everybody wants to ask the person that's teaching them, how long do you think it's going to take before I, before I start making money? Well, if that's the first question you're worrying about, it's going to be a lot longer than you want it to be. Because you're making it about the money. When if you just simply say, I want to get good at reading price action and I want to be desensitized to where I believe it's going to go and I'm submitting to whatever it does. That's a person that's going to make a lot of fucking money. That's a person that's going to be so consistent. And they're not going to be swayed by any little fluctuation in the marketplace that might scare everyone else. I mentioned it today live. I said, look at this big green candle here. Some of you are like, oh, I'm getting nervous. It's going to reverse. No, it's going to go lower. It's going to go lower. It did. And that's what it's like when you have experience. You want to see these up close candles when the market's going lower because you want to see price repel away from it. That's a bear shoulder block. You want to see the middle of that up close candle hold price down. That's the mean threshold. And when you start seeing it go up into that level and just fail to go any higher, it hits like this invisible force field where it will not let it go past it. Iron dome, baby. Nothing gets through this. It stops right here. When you see that, when you're watching that in price action, that's immediate feedback that you're on side. That means you're right. That means you're right in your direction. So stay with the idea. But if you start seeing premium arrays when you're bearish and three of them fail, bearish order block, mean threshold breaks. It trades above a short-term high where buy side is and then goes through a fair value gap above that. Well, you, you probably reversed and you missed it. So now you got to make the decision. Do you abort it right there or do you wait for a small little retracement in your favor and get out? That's experience. In the beginning, as soon as you see three fail, kill it, abort it. Don't even waste any time. I walked you through how the dollar index went up into three premium arrays I outlined. I, was I talked about it before it happened. So I was taking your attention there. I told you, go into your own chart. And I felt sorry for some of you because I know you're new. And I went into the chart and showed you where it was. It also outlined how we were going lower, lower, and then another low in ES, but almost getting to that new week opening gap low. At the same time, it went into three premium arrays on the dollar index. Time of day, we're going into that three o'clock hour. Well, you saw that <laughs> shoots up. Not surprised. Why? Because it's doing something 
that's symmetrical. Dollar index went up into three premium arrays. ES went down into the new week opening gap, high, new week opening gap, consequent encroachment. And we're in the lower quadrant of that new week opening gap. At the same time, dollar has dug into its buy side liquidity. It went through that volume, I'm sorry, um, liquidity void where there's an actual gap yesterday evening when it started trading again. And the buy side liquidity at the 45th level or something to that effect. 0.45, one or two, four, five, I think it was. Um, it went through both of that, both of the, all three of them rather. And now we went to what? Time. Time. So things are going to happen around certain times of the day. So you're constantly balancing what you're reading, interp interpreting from price delivery, and other markets that are important. So if the dollar's going up, that's what? That's risk off. It's going up to what? Into liquidity. Three premium arrays was, was traded into. And then we did that at a time of day where it can do what? Price in the daily range extreme. High or low. What's it been doing since the afternoon? Trading lower. It went completely down through the opening range gap and through it, taking out the low of yesterday. Now we're trading at three o'clock. Final hour trading. We've already made a run below the low yesterday. So what's it likely to do? Draw back on those individuals that have been doing what? Making money. That's what a macro does. It rolls against whoever's been profitable right now. Or it completes a higher time frame array. So in other words, if the morning session is rolling higher, 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 the macro will spool, send price up into the higher time frame array. 950, 1010, 1050, 1110. That's it. Simple. But you don't understand what simple means because you're new at what we're doing here. So that's the reason why I tell everyone to learn how to do this, you have to give me a year. And then you will see a full calendar year. You'll see the seasonal impacts that causes these major fluctuations or what I call a quarterly shift where we have major macro changes in the tide of direction and price action. And then you find what that is and you try to get in sync with that and you mine that. You try to work within that. So in other words, if we're looking at a quarterly shift, in other words, we're looking at two to three months of price movement on a daily chart and weekly chart to a higher time frame array, higher or lower. If we identify what we're in, bearish or bullish, you're going to really try to focus in on the weeks that are likely to expand on that weekly candle in that quarterly shifts direction. So we're going from a higher time frame to a lower time frame with the context of a quarterly shift seasonal tendency weekly range expansion in the direction of that seasonal tendency that's when you're going to do the highest leverage whatever your maximum leverage is those are those instances where you do that you don't want to do it when if your analysis on the higher time frame weekly and daily saying that we're bearish for the next two to three uh, two to three months we're expecting prices to, to gravitate lower okay you may do your analysis and say, okay, well, we've been going down for a little bit, and now this weekly candle could expand, expand higher. You don't want to do your, your largest leverage or risk the most that you would normally do as a high-end leverage in that instance because you're going against your quarterly shift in the seasonal tendency. So you're not gambling. You're taking the trade, but you're limiting your exposure to risk based on your higher time frame macro analysis. And all these things come together. And then when you have the market finish its expansion against the quarterly shift, whatever your seasonal tendency is, for the next two, two to three months analysis, that's weekly and daily chart driven. Then if you have something that's going to expand on the weekly chart that's in that same direction of the higher time frame monthly and weekly chart, you now you're in 
the movement or expectation of that quarterly shift being bearish. Now you're expecting the next week when you're doing analysis on Sunday or Saturday before the market opens up, you're expecting that weekly candle to expand lower. What are you going to do in those instances? You're going to use potentially your largest leverage or do what? Pyramid. When don't, when don't you pyramid ICT? When it goes against the higher time frame order flow or a quarterly shift. Then I just do simple, get in, do my position, get out. Be done with it. You don't want to push violently with you know your equity trying to increase it when it's going against the macro order flow. This this two to three month higher time frame seasonal tendency that we were trying to discern. If you know that you're going against that, why would you risk more? Why would you push your account? Because you're the chances of it delivering is what not as high. And with low resistance, as it would be if you were in a two to three month higher time frame bearish market, you're expecting seasonal tendencies to send it lower and then waiting for the next weekly candle that you are likely to see it expand lower. So therefore, you're trying to go short. Everything is framing a idea that you're trying to build a position going short with everything in your favor going down. Then you can do pyramiding. Then you can build your positions larger and you can hold on to those positions longer and not take partial so quickly or that much off as your first partial. See how there's a graduated understanding that all these things come together and it's a beautiful tapestry, but you can't learn it all just because I sit down with you and spend hours. There's a lot of other things that have to be understood. And it, that's what I mean when I say you can't have these expectations of sitting down like that young man in the parable of the jade master you know, yes it's not a true story but it's i love that story because it teaches that when a student thinks they're ready and they go to someone that is equipped to teach them they go there with the expectation that they know how to be taught they, they they know how to be trained or taught how to do it so who's the master there they're pretending to be the master but the master knows that this is how everybody comes to the master <laughs> this is how it is you come to the instructor thinking that you know how you're supposed to be taught and trained. No, 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 don't, do, don't teach me this. This is how I want you to teach me. How do you know the benefits of that? If you don't know something, how can you say, teach me it this way? Makes no sense. That's a person that's not in a position to be trained. They're unteachable at that moment. And that's what those exercises and those drills that the, the Jade Master puts that young man through makes him do chores, talks to him about things that are outside the, the topic of Jade. I'm doing the same thing many times in these lectures because I'm teaching you to do what? Build discipline. Build patience. You're learning everything you are here to learn. I'm not wasting your time. But I'm also fortifying your understanding, I'm presenting things that you're going to lean on when you start pushing real buttons. And when you get in those real thick moments of, oh boy, I'm really in it now. What are you going to remember? You're going to remember all these discussions. My voice is going to pop in your head and it's going to be like, oh shit, that makes sense now. He talked about this. This is what I'm supposed to do. I remember he said, this is what usually happens. So just submit to this idea and let's see what happens. Instead of Oh, man, what am I supposed to do? The, the analogy earlier, where you get into a trade, you don't have a, you know, a profit target put in, and it blows up in your favor, and you don't know what to do. That's a terrible feeling. It's a good problem to have, <laughs> don't get me wrong, but it's a terrible feeling because you're making money and you're frozen in confusion, panic, and bewilderment. Like you don't know what to do. How unfortunate. How unfortunate for an individual to end up in that condition. And yet it happens many times. And those are the same instances that you've done that with your demo account. And you think that that is the invitation for you to start trading with real money. Man, it could happen like that with my funded account. If I can just get lucky to pass my combine. 
then I can do these trades and might get lucky. And I'll just withdraw my first $5,000. If I could just get $5,000 out of me, that's all I'm looking for. Who cares? It's worth it if I blow the account after that. I mean, $5,000. There's so many of you that think like that. Be honest. You probably felt like that before. Maybe you don't think that way now. And if you're really honest, brutally honest with yourself and me and the community, you would say so on Twitter right now. Like, yeah, that's exactly what I've contemplated many times. It's worth it for me. It's a couple hundred dollars to get in there. If I blow it, who cares? I can just do a hundred dollar reset. I don't know if that's true, how that works, but I know it's not a full amount of money to pay for it. And you're thinking, oh, well, it's just like the lottery ticket. Whatever the payout is, it's worth it. If it's a couple thousand dollars, it's more money than I paid to do the challenge in the combine. And if that's how you're thinking, you're really selling yourself short. Like, why waste your time with that when you can do it the right way? Make 6% on that account. Build it up over months. And make 50% in six months of whatever that equity base is. If you're doing 100000 in six months, build it up to 50000 Do your profit split. Boom, there it is. You're done. You're in business now. You have enough money to, to do your own and still do that funded account. And you're just talking about one account. Not like the savages I'm creating, where they're managing 1.2, 1.4, you know, all these crazy ass uh, you know, funded account thresholds they're operating in. They know what they're doing. They know what they're trying to accomplish. They didn't think that way and know what they were doing in when they first started. You're learning. You're learning a lot about yourself. You're learning that there is no randomness to these markets. And the truth is, you're probably intimidated by how much you have learned in such a short period of time. It might be creating a scatterbrain feeling where it's information overload. And that's normal. It's absolutely normal. And that's exactly what happened with my my paid students, like I gave them more content than they can technically digest. Even though it was over the course of an entire year, they were getting every day new content, live streams, and eight lessons that you see in that core content. Think about that. And I was posting charts, static charts for a while in the forum. I don't do that anymore. So it was too much. But I told them that's what it was going to be like. And not to try to, you know, to cram everything in one year, to just relax and let it happen. And every one of my students that are making big money, none of them are coming forward and saying, yep, I figured it out in nine months, 12 months, a year. It took them time, years, plural. And I'm honest, I've been telling you all that from the beginning. Anybody that's made big money as a, you know, a, a trader worth listening to, I'm not talking about people on Twitter, you know, real big fund manager type level traders. If you had an opportunity to talk to them, they're all going to tell you it's going to take you years to know, really know how to trade. Can you be profitable less time than that? Yeah, but you're not going to know yourself. You're not going to know your model like the back of your hand. You're not going to know what it is that you're doing. You're not going to be me. I know I can walk into any market environment and I will find a pound of flesh. You don't need to be able to do that. All you need to be able to do is know when your model is going to materialize in price and be there on time when it's supposed to be there. When it's done, close your charts and go about your business. Not, I made money. Let me do it again real quick because it feels good. That's like a drug addict getting its first hit. Heroin or cocaine or whatever, whatever the first high is, they say that, that you always try to chase that high and you can never get it. That's what it feels like when you start trading with your model. You know what you're looking for. And when it happens and it's like, bang, there it is. That power, that sense of accomplishment, the feeling of dialed in, you feel like your fucking net worth is 
$200 million all of a sudden. You just feel like you're minted. You, you arrived. Like you know exactly this is, a, this is exactly what you were meant to feel like. Your whole life was for this moment. And it feels so good. It's intoxicating. And then soon as you feel it wearing off, which will be minutes, your natural impulses is the, I want to go back and do that again. The move already happened. So you have to put the gambler in the back seat and say, you don't get to drive. Take the keys away and keep the gambler from doing anything. You're not conversating with them. You're not having any discussions about anything emotional. You did what you did. You felt good about it. Now close your charts. Exercise discipline. Forge responsibility. That's hard. That is so hard. And I can't write chapters, not just chapter. I can't write a book entirely about that and still scratch the surface because it has to be experienced. You have to feel what that's like. Just like it feels different when you move into live fund trading, even if it's a small, minute, little bit amount of money. Your expectations on yourself and the elevated hopes for you surviving the live trade, let alone making money. Because when you first think you're going to get in there, it's like, okay, I, I'm going to push this trade. It might work. But in your mind, you're thinking, oh, shit, this is probably going to fail. This is going to fail, man. I got to do it, though. I got to get it out of the way. Let me just get in here and do it. You put the trade on, and as soon as you push the button, the weight of the world is on your neck. Now, mind you, you're trading very, very small leverage, probably the smallest. But it feels like your heart's going to stop. It feels like you can't breathe, like someone's holding you in a bear hug. Palm starts sweating. Feel a little bit faint. And now you just want to close the trade, but you don't want to close the trade. But you, you do. But really, you don't. And you're wrestling with that. And you just want to get out of it. You're up one tick, three ticks, down below the dealing spread. Up two ticks, three ticks. And you can't stand it anymore. Please, let me just get out of this trade. I just got to recuperate and, and, and just gather my thoughts. That's what it feels like when you put your first live trade on with real money. That's what it feels like. And some of you are going to be shocked when you feel that. And that's why you have to do it with very, very little money. And you have to talk to yourself and remind yourself, how did I do in the demo? What was I doing? What was I focusing on? And take your money out of the equation. Focus on price. That's the truth. That's the thing that you're supposed to do. But it won't feel like that's what you're supposed to do. You're going to be worrying about the money. You're going to be counting the ticks up and down. And the worst thing you can do is have that money tab showing you the profit and loss in your trade. That shouldn't even be on your chart. Put your trade on, put your limit and all that business on it, and then toggle that off. Then go back to watching price. The orders will be there. They're there to do their job. That's it. Let it go. You don't have any control. You can't steer price. You can't make it go there faster. You have to submit to that. And it's like a lifetime. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour feels like a lifetime. It feels like you gave up five of your life, uh, five of your life years in that trade. And as you do more of it and you trust your model, it feels like nothing. Like the live stream today that I did with you, it literally felt like 15 minutes to me. It doesn't feel like a long time. Not that an hour or so was a long time. It's not, but it didn't feel like an hour to me. For some of you, it probably was like you could have made this shorter. 
but I wouldn't have been able to teach you everything I taught you in that live stream now, could I? So there's a lot of things that you're going to discover that are true, true about yourself and true about the markets and true about what it is that I'm teaching you. And those experiences are going to be uniquely personal to you and how you deal with them, how you wrestle with them is all going to be an individual experience. Some of it's going to be positive. Some of it's going to be negative. And you're going to learn from those things. And I can't write a book. No one else can write a book how to prepare for it. Because everyone's going to deal with it differently. And you need to expect that adversity, excitement, that new level. But with a new level means there's a new boss to fight. There's a new devil to wrestle. New levels, new devils. And that's what it's like in this industry until you get to the point where you know yourself, you know your model, you know the market and the conditions that you'd like to operate in. And when those things are not in alignment, that's not an invitation for you to simply because you have time to turn the charts on and see what happens when you press the button. You don't need to know after you push the button, what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen. As soon as you push the button in those conditions where you know it's not likely for you to be trading that, it's not high probability, but you're bored. So my major man at work, you just got to have some kind of distraction. And if you win, even if it's 50 bucks, that's 50 bucks you didn't have. And guess what? It feels good to be able to do that because I took something from somebody else. Because right now I'm pissed off. Right now, I'm having a hard time. I'm stressing about something. And I just need to be able to feel good about myself. I have to have a, an accomplishment. Let me get out there and live stream. I'm going to show the world I'm an awesome trader. And you got there and you push the button and you wreck your ass. And you just compounded all that grief. And you just brought witnesses into it. Well done. You played yourself. You know, once you know what you're doing, you know that that outcome is going to be unfavorable. So you don't do it. You don't trade to see what find, see what's going to happen. You don't push the button to find out what's going to happen. You don't trade and push a button just to see if you can feel better about yourself. Your trades are not to make yourself better. Your trades are there to make fucking money. That's it. That's the only reason why you're doing this. It's not to impress Carl. It's not to impress your spouse. It's not to impress your friends it's not to make yourself feel like you're accomplished it's a derivative you're doing this to make money if any time you feel the impulse to push the button because you need to feel better about yourself you want to push the button to distract yourself from something someone said about you on social media You feel bored. Nothing else to do. Let me just get in here and trade Asia. You don't ever trade Asia. Never never even came up in your model. Uh, you know what? It might if I get three handles, it's it's 150 bucks per contract. And my fund account says I can trade this many contracts. So let me just do one quarter of that and just see you know how I feel after I win. Well, you're inviting the very thing that you shouldn't be doing. Who's going to be there to stop you? I'm not going to be there. Your broker's not going to say, hey, you better not do that. You better not do that right now. Who's going to do it? Who's going to be the person that stands in the way and talks to you and reminds you that what you're doing is outside your model? It's just you. And you don't want to learn from bad experiences, doing impulsive things that you're reckless. You don't want to discover that you're reckless by doing those things. You want to prevent the opportunity of discovering that you're reckless in those instances. Talking to yourself through your journal, referring to your journal, writing down what you intend to do that trading day. What? 
What did you just say, Michael? Write down what I plan on doing today? I thought I was just going to look for fair value gaps. Well, yeah, that's yeah, it's in part of the anticipatory price skills that you're learning, yeah. But it makes you much more accountable when you write down what you intend to do. I want to take a trade, like on Tuesday, I want to sell short a fair value gap after there's displacement lower, and I want to take profit at this level because there's sell side there. Write it out. You should have a notepad where you are trading. If you're walking around at work, at lunch, smoke breaks or whatever, and you're doing everything from your phone, you're gambling. You need to have it written out. What's your plan of attack? Just like war. Just like football. They have their playbook. Everything they're doing is a strategy that every player on that team understands what that play is. That's like a football name. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know shit about that game. But I know this. They have a playbook. And the coaches say, play this. Quarterback tells the players, we're playing this. The stinky leg, run around, so-and-so play. <laughs> whatever, whatever the hell it is. I don't know. I, don't, I couldn't tell you. The flea flicker. I think that's something that's real. If it ain't, fuck it. But game plan is you write it out. If you write it out, chances are you're going to probably submit to it better than you just staring at the chart, impulsively reacting like retail. And if you write it out, you're more inclined to wait for the setup to form. But ICT, what happens if I'm watching? What did this say? You write it out. Then you wait for it. But ICT, what if I'm looking? You write it out and you wait for it. Simple. Next to impossible for someone that's new, but it's simple. That's how you forge discipline. That's how you forge responsibility. That's how you plan your trade. And trade your plan. In the beginning, you need to be diligent about it. But in the beginning, that's where everybody's reckless. It's like spring break and everybody brought kegs. Oh, it's time to get drunk. You can't operate like that. Not here. Not here. Not, not, not in this industry. You can't do that. It's unforgiving. Some of you are going through combines trying to get these funded account challenges passed. I placed a lot of emphasis on my son with this one. Like he didn't do any trades today. And I told him, I said, you can't do anything today. And I let him dabble with the demo. And I told him, I said, tell me what you think you're trying to do. And then you execute. He got all chopped up today. Okay. And that's fine. I mean, you have to, you have to see that, but he wanted to have, a win in that combine. We had one day off this week and I told him, I said, we're going to take another off today. Don't be trying to get that $9,000 right away. You don't need to do it. Just because it says you have to trade five days doesn't mean do it in five days or less. That's unrealistic. It's unrealistic for him. So to curb his impulsive desires, like I teach you, I said, here, let me reset the paper account. You try to do what you think you would do in that combine right now today. Eight trades, every single one of them dusted. Now, it's not because he should be profitable because he doesn't know what he's doing. And truth be told, he's pushing the button, but daddy's telling him, do this, do that. I'm teaching him that very short time frame scalping model, but he's the one clicking the button. He discovered today what it felt like if he would have done it with that combine. That, at that combine, he would have lost his perfect no losing day, no losing trade. That's that's what I placed on him. I said, "Listen, you don't need to make a lot. It's real easy to make that nine thousand dollars, but you got to give yourself time. What happens if it takes you two weeks?" Does it mean anything that, you know, it took you two weeks versus 
what you thought five days meant. Like he thought five days, you got to do it in five days because it says you have to trade at least five days. So I told him, I said, don't do that. Don't worry about that. Think about what it's like where you work because he works at a coffee shop. And if you don't know anything about me, I, I make my children work. It's work hardening. I could give them cash, but they're not learning. I, I did that with my oldest son and he didn't appreciate it. He just wants more money. <laughs> he he wasted on dumb shit and then says, Dad, I need help with something else, like my daughter. So I messed up with the two older ones. But the other ones, you know, I'm making them work. And yeah, they 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 work jobs that wouldn't be flashy. They're not college degree type white collar jobs. It's you're grunt working. You're Working in a warehouse, Caleb, you're doing uh, coffee shit and dealing with people cussing you out in the drive through window, Cameron. And I want them to feel that. And I want them to feel like I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing this dumb shit. Not to hate other people and think that they're elite. But I want them to feel like I don't want to do this. And it's funny, my youngest son, he's in a hurry. To work at a fucking Rita's Italian Ice. <laughs> a, a, my youngest is very, very immature. Way, way, way more immature than his age is. So his whole outlook on working is, you know, childlike. But Cameron and Caleb, when they see their trades, in the demo, like when, when I'm telling them, look, this is not when you want to trade. And I tell them, go into your demo and paper trade and show me what you would have done. And you could just read it on their face. It's like, I mean, I'm glad it didn't happen, but you were right, dad. And they, they don't like that. Like they don't like when dad's right about it like that, because what they wanted was what? To go in there impulsively and do it. And then look at me and say, see, you didn't want me to do it, but I did it. And that's, what I'm wrestling with with them. Like Cameron is very competitive. Like he's on sports games and um, like all these combat games and shit on Xbox Live. And he's a bit of a shit talker. Like he's he's very respectful in in real world, but when he's up on Xbox Live, you know, he's up there screaming and hollering like <laughs> he's rowdy. He's really rowdy. So he's a bit of a hurry to get out here and start smacking assholes around on social media. So he's going to be a menace once I make him formidable. So he, he's going to be the one that runs around and gets in everybody's ass and stuff and show everybody what he's doing. He's in a hurry to do that. And I'm trying to wrestle that and wrangle that in him because it'll undo him. He's, he's too motivated for all the wrong reasons. So today was a very sobering experiment for him i said i know what you want to do and i understand why you're trying to do it and i also understand that the young man in you because you're all hopped up on testosterone and you're in your your peak of rebellion and you want to show dad that you can whip dad's ass and what i believe you're going to do and what you think you're going to do with this today i'm telling you just trust this do whatever you would do in that paper trading account and we'll watch and see what happens. And it was very, very humbling for him today. And it, it, it was almost like, I wouldn't say his spirit was broken, but I would say that it was near heartbreaking for me as his dad. Cause it was like, he wanted so badly to be able to say, I was able to do it even though you thought I couldn't dad. And I had to reserve a lot of the things that would otherwise be coaching. I wanted him to just experience that because I need him to feel the weight of that. Because unless you feel that, you won't be denying yourself that when you trade with your account. Because that feeling of, I want to prove something. Okay, prove you have self-control and don't fucking gamble. How about that? Let's start there. But unfortunately, nobody thinks that way. I didn't think that way when I was 20 years old. I thought, I got to prove myself to everybody. 
I got to prove it. I got to constantly prove, prove, prove. And unfortunately, everybody that ever does that always does themselves in. It never works out like that. It's odd. It's just like, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy that you want to do something to elevate your perspective that other people have towards you. The, the outward appearance that you have it all put together and you're, you're it. Kid ego. And I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to be successful in wrangling this boy's He's wild. Like he wants to literally come out here. He goes, Dad, I'm going to do this. I'm like, okay, I understand. But give me a chance to get you there. I want to watch you do it. Trust me. I want to see all that shit. But let me turn you into that first. And you just literally just started. Like you, It doesn't happen that quick. And today he had a, a real taste of humble pie today. And it was, it was a good thing. But I hope he doesn't beat himself up too badly about it because you know how it is when a young man like think about it you're 18 years old you know you think you know everything when you don't know shit and he's he has an ego like he's really good at everything he does whether it be you know the sports that he plays or you know the video games he's really good at like he's just he, he tries to be the best which is great i love that but dad's dad and i told him i said Today is a day you don't touch the combine. You don't do any of that. You don't do nothing. You don't do anything outside of a paper trading account. But, but, but nothing. This is what you do. Show me what you would do. In the first trade, he's sitting there. He's like, "All right, uh, all right. This is this is what you said it should do here." I said, "I didn't say that today. I'm silent right now." You tell me what you would do because you said you wanted to trade it. You tell me what you were going to do today. You're driving right now. You know the rules I've told you. Where do you what do you see? I'm not going to talk today. You're going to show me because you said that you figured it out. You know what you're going to do today. You feel confident. Show me. Show me what that equates to when you push the button. Lose. Lose. <laughs> lose and then i watch he's like rolling his shoulders he's pumping his shoulders and he's like oh. like he's thinking i'm gonna i'm gonna turn this around and i'm gonna be able to shove this in dad's face and say now hmm. I, I, I could just see it on his face he wanted to do that and i'm sitting back here trying not to show any kind of emotion i don't want to you know spur that type of shit on and i also don't want to break his spirit so i'm just letting him do it and finally you know the last one he's like all right I couldn't, I can't do it today, Dad. He didn't say I was right, but he wouldn't make eye contact with me. And I told him, I said, son, listen, this is going to happen to you when you're trading with real money. And you have to know when not to do this. Everything you showed this morning was outward reasons to want to trade instead of taking the model. None of the times that you pushed the button was the model at all. You were manifesting your desire to prove to dad that you could do it when I was saying don't. You were arm wrestling me. You have to refrain from that. I have students that did that in mentorship and then argue with me. It doesn't work when they were fading everything I said in commentary. Look what I'm doing in live streams. Fade that. Would you do well? Fuck no. And I had students in the 2016, 2017, and 2018 groups that consistently, contrarianly faded everything I said in Euro and Cable. And then had the audacity to send me emails saying, this shit doesn't work. I guess it doesn't work. I guess, you're, I guess you aren't going to be successful when you're holding the chart upside down. And... Some of them, I have never been successful in making them understand what they're doing. They're, they, I mean, how, how do you tell them? I think about that. Let's say you're the mentor. Like, how do you tell them in a way that is not derogatory? Because there was a few times I was like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Like, do you not understand what you're doing is asked backwards? Like, I'm telling you, go north. You're running south. 
twice the speed I told you to go north, you're running south. And then saying, I'm not getting where I'm supposed to go. Like, I'm never arriving where you said I should be. Where the hell are you going? You're going the wrong direction. You're doing that. Well, Cameron had that experience this morning. And it sucks. Because you have to wrestle with that. He's walking around here today. It's like a chip on his shoulder. It's his youth. It's his male ball and chain pride. Pride. You want to show me. Yeah, there's a lot of people that want to show ICT and they wreck their ass on live streams. They wreck their ass in their results. And I didn't even mess with them. <laughs> they brought it on themselves. And my own son tried it today. And all I'm trying to do is make him prepared. That's all I'm doing. I'm trying to prepare him. But he was adamant. I'm going to do it, Dad. I, I know I can do it, son. Today's not a day in the morning session. This is what I'm trying to explain to you. The rules I teach you. He wasn't trying to hear it. He's like, no, Dad. I think I'm going <laughs> to. Okay. But you're not allowed to do that there. You're going to do it with this. Reset the paper trading account. I put one trade on so that way when I walk away, my trade's in there. It, he didn't reset it because he did that one time already on me. <laughs> I said, uh, let me see the history. All right, wait a minute, one second. One second. Let me see the history. You're not in a trade. And he had something that was not what I started the account with. I said, did you do something wrong? <sighs> yeah, I did some stupid shit. I said, well, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. The whole point is you got to show me what you're doing. I can't help you if you don't show me what you did wrong because I want to ask you what you saw there. What did you do wrong? Hiding the, the losing trades or the, the examples that you're trying to push the button on, hiding that from me is making it impossible for me to help you. Like I got to take you into that trade and say, what did you do? What did you see? And then I can show you where you did it wrong. But you're trying to put a, a blinder up. No, I don't want to look at that, and I don't want to show dad that. That's the whole reason why I reset the account. I do one trade. That means that that trade better fucking be there when I ask you to show me what you've done. And he tried it one time. It's shame. That's all it was. I mean, he's not trying to be sneaky about it. He just, he just got reckless. Okay. It's good that you're doing it in a paper trading account like that. But don't hide it. And that's his lesson for all of you. Like, Don't hide from those mistakes. Don't beat yourself up about them, which is what he was trying to do. He was trying to teach himself subconsciously to hide it, sweep it under the rug. And you have to learn from them. Don't hide from them. Embrace them. That's when you want to see yourself fail. In the beginning, when it's safe, where there's no money to lose, no mental baggage accumulated because of it. But when you start doing stuff like that, think about it, a paper trading account, and he's hiding it. You know that it's just stupid shit you used to do. <clears throat> Everybody's done it. Oh, well, you know, my next my next time, I'll, I won't make these dumb decisions. Let me just reset the paper trading account, the demo account, and you know we'll focus on the wins. It's just much like what happens when people get these stupid trade ideas where they do 50 lots of gold. When they're not really able to trade 50 lots, they wouldn't have the leverage to do it anyway. And they're doing 50 lots entry. Two seconds later, they're buying it again, 50 lots. And they're doing, again, 50 lots. And they have a series of 12 to 15 50 lot entries where they're all off by one or two pips. And they show that on social media. They're all $90,000 plus wins, open profit on a demo account. And then, then they, think, they think that's going to be something for people to say whoa look at that wow to me when i see stuff like that like what are you trying to communicate there like what made you feel that that was a good thing to put on the social media because that looks like you have no idea what the hell you're doing and that number while it might be large means absolutely nothing it means nothing it's not like you took an account and you parlayed 20 30 trades up and you got that result after many different trades, you're just over leveraging something that you never would do with real money. And it's all these stupid little games that new traders do 
because you're trying to entertain yourself instead of saying, all right, this is what ICT or whoever you're learning from says I should be doing and practicing and studying. And I should be pressing into that and finding my entertainment and growth in that result, not silly shit, hiding from the losing trades, pretending that they didn't exist, only looking at the wins and over leveraging dumb shit to, to feel like you're doing something constructive. You're not. If you're over leveraging your, your, your demo, your paper trading account, just to you know, run up a, a fake number, what do you do? Oh, it's, it's stupid. It's dumb. Getting in a demo account and practicing your entries, getting in there, practicing so you can have very, very low drawdown, and then doing lots of sample sets like that, that's constructive use of a demo. Not over leveraging just to see what you can do with it because it, it's not doing anything for you. You can't spend that money. You're wasting time that you could have been using for entry drills, getting in there, waiting for the market to trade into an order block, a fair value gap, and trying to nail the middle point. Consequent encroachment of a fair value gap. That's a skill set that you should be practicing all the time on all time frames. If it stops you out or goes through the fair value gap, who cares? What you're doing is, is you're conditioning yourself to wait and watch for it to trade into that. And then when it does and it goes up and you're trying to trade into a sell side liquidity or something in, in discount, in other words, going short, and then you're watching price trade up into that fair value gap, watch with your eyeball. When it hits the midpoint, you time it right then and there. Boom. That's a timing drill. And it's also it, it, it completely desensitizes yourself to selling short in up moves because there's a lot of you that are going to be scared of doing that. Some of you are probably terrified right now. I just don't know if I can do that, man. Like, how do you know that it won't go through the fair value gap? Well, how do you know? It's because you've done it hundreds of times. You've conditioned yourself to see, oh, this is what it looks like. See, you all want to see the fair value gap work, but you don't want to practice when it trades into it. Even with a demo, it's like you're scared to get the results. Just like my son this morning. I made him do it right in front of me. It, it probably would have been a lot easier for him had he not done it right in front of me. But because I was watching, every losing trade felt like the weight of the world on his shoulders. Now, I'm not the kind of dad in this. I would I would never say, I told you so. You dumbass. Why didn't you listen to your dad? <laughs> I would never do that. I don't want to do anything to steer him away from wanting to do this. I've been wanting all of my children to do this. And now to see him want to do it, I want to make sure he does everything right. And I want to encourage him. I want to keep him going the right way. And, you know, hopefully I'll be successful in that regard. But, uh, you know, that remains to be seen. But he's a human being just like you and I are. Doing dumb things. You know, playing stupid games and winning stupid prizes right <laughs> but when you're 18 and you're a young male and an athlete and typically you know that's already enough to be an ego tripping maniac but now you add to it that he's got my dna in him and he wants to prove his dad that he's you know capable it's just a perfect recipe for him to just blow up and i don't want him to do that like I'm, I'm very, very, very interested in making sure he does everything right. Because I know once he sees it's done correctly, he can do what he does at his coffee shop in one trade. What he would earn at the whole entire month at that shit show, he can do that in one trade. I want him to experience that. Because once that happens, the magic really begins. Because he'll be like, oh, hell no. No more video games. No more other dumb shit. I'm going to do this. Because then he'll want to take that skill set and show his friends that, look, this is what I'm able to do. He, his friends don't know he's doing any of that right now. Soccer team players, none of them know anything about it. They all know me and, and who I am, but they don't know that he's involved in it yet. And he wants to be able to say, this is what I was able to do. Boom. Because he wants to teach them. That's cool. But... I want him to learn properly. And we all know what it's like when we first started doing this stuff. We did everything wrong. 
We made excuses for why we did it. Oh, it's harmless. It's only a demo. <laughs> Who cares, right? But that's how it starts. That's how toxic thinking, that's how stupid, lazy, wasting time, dumb stuff, instead of going in there and doing laboratory experiments, timing, entries, trying to do entries with the least amount of drawdown. Running out the, you know, sell side, waiting for it when it's so obvious, when you still have five handles left. This is another exercise I like to do. Right before it runs out on old low, you are chasing price in this drill. You are doing that. But drop down into a 15 minute, I'm sorry, 15 second chart and wait for price to run up into a volume imbalance or a premium fair value gap on a 15 second chart. Right before it goes to a new low. To run out like sell side, that is an exercise I like to do all the time. Like I do that many times while I'm actually talking to you, you know, on Twitter. Like when I'm tweeting things, I'm doing a lot of exercises like that on a five second chart, a 15 second chart. And I'm using literally like a 15 minute higher low. It doesn't even have to be far away from wherever the price is at. And I'm just trying to get like three handles, four handles, and then boom, there it is. If it allows that much range, there it is. And I I show my son all the time, like, like this is it. Like literally, that's your that's your whole week at this coffee shop. Right there. Just like that. And in literally in three minutes, that's your whole week dealing with that shit over there. And people talking to you like you're, you know, subhuman over a fucking coffee. And these people are ignorant. You should hear some of the stories he talks about. And as much as I want him to be able to say, this is my last day, fuck all, uh, fuck all of you. I'm, I'm done. I ain't never going to come back here again. I need him to experience that because it will motivate him to never want to ever do that shit ever again. That's what it was like for me when I was working all these fucking menial jobs. You know, working for people that I knew just because you went to college, you're not even smart. You're a dumbass. Like, you don't even know what you're doing as your own job. Like, you don't even know how to do your job. I know your job. And you're the manager. And you're trying to tell me when I can have off? When I can do certain things? Nah, get the fuck out of here. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be submissive to that. I'm going to change everything. They don't have that. He's having it now. He's learning that. And it's good for him to have that. It's good. It builds character. It's not, oh, you're letting your children do stupid shit. You're so rich. You should be doing that. Man, fuck off. When your kids get older and they are in a, a working age, if you give them all, which you don't have as money, uh, but if you were able to give them money, you're not setting them up for anything for success. You're giving them money they didn't earn because I've watched this with my older two. They squandered it. They fucking wasted it. They blew it on dumb shit and then got into more debt. And then I had to bail them out. Credit card debt. Couldn't make their car payment. Okay. There you go. Boom. There it is. I'm talking about my, my daughter because she had a car helped by her biological dad. I'm not her biological father. And she got herself in financial trouble. So I ended up giving her my first Highlander. We drove it down, gave it to her, and, and she has that now. But it was just uh, very stressful. And when you start making a lot of money and you have ch children, if you end up having kids or if you have kids now, I have learned the hard way that just giving them money just makes it more stressful as a parent because they don't appreciate money because they didn't earn it. They didn't work for it, and they think that you're an ATM that all they got to do is say, Daddy, and you bail them out. And I don't want to see them fail, obviously, but that part's hard. Having money doesn't really make things easier. It makes it harder as a parent, especially when your kids know that you have it, and they know that you love them, and you don't want to see them fail. That's going to be a deciding factor for some of you as traders, too. That is an unfolding truth. That you don't foresee right now, but you will encounter it if you have kids. And if you have lots of money that you've made from the markets, guess what? 
you're going to have that heartstring tugging on you too. You want to feel like you can remove them from the adversities that working with Carl does. You want to be able to tell them, go in there and tell them this is your last day and feel good about it and walk out. That's what you want to do as a parent. You want them to, you want to free them from that stuff. Empower them like that. But you aren't empowering them. What you're doing is you're creating, and I didn't see this in the beginning. Like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't expect to see this. But someone told me years ago this is what was going to happen. And it happened. I mean, they didn't appreciate it. And they wasted the money. And they're not any better off because of it. Yeah, they have vehicles, you know. They got out of debt because I bailed them out. But they are not equipped. You know, my oldest son doesn't want to spend time learning how to do this because he's bent out of shape about his money being tied up with the crypto bullshit. And my, my daughter just doesn't want to do it. And it frustrates me. I don't understand why don't you want to do this. They seen Caleb do it. Cameron seen Caleb do it. So now he's motivated. He wants to do better than him, which is wonderful. I love that. <laughs> and I know if Cameron does it, that will make my youngest want to do it. And hopefully my two older ones will be like, well, shit, we're older than them and they're doing better than us. But let us start doing it too. And that's my plan. That's what I'm hoping that it's going to pan out like that. I don't know if it's going to. I mean, they could still be you know, how they are and not do anything regardless of how successful the young ones get. But I'm literally ensuring that Cameron is successful. I want to see him be the monster he wants to be. I'm letting him be that. It's in his personality to do it anyway. I ain't going to stop him. I couldn't stop him because it's who he is. So if that's where he wants to go, and I want him to be a monster in this, he will be the right version of me when I was 20. I was... <laughs> that's another discussion but I believe that Cameron would he, he's going to be the one that uh, he's the 2.0 that, that's that's the one Caleb's just steady Eddie he, he doesn't want to draw any special attention to himself Cameron wants all of it he wants all the smoke he wants all of it every bit of it <laughs> he's got a hit list of who he wants to go after and Make look stupid and, and whatever. I told him, I said, when you start doing that, son, just understand that once you put that out there like that, that energy will come right back to you. And then you're going to be constantly having that kind of shit online. And that's that's what you want to do. You know, it's your life to spend it doing like that. But he goes, I don't care, dad. This is what I want to do. I'm sick of this and sick of that. Okay, well, whatever. So... <laughs> The men understand. You're probably laughing and smiling. Like, yeah, I remember when it's like to be young too. But I don't want to see him do it for all the wrong reasons. Like, I want him to feel like he's building a legacy for his children should he decide to. Let me tell you something real quick uh, as a side topic. Since we're all friends here tonight, hanging out. Where did that fuzzy thing come from? The, um, my son Cameron has a girlfriend. And uh, they've been dating for a number of years. And obviously, you know, teenagers being teenagers left an opportunity where things can happen. They've been happening for a while, obviously. And I I and my wife found out last week that we were under the assumption that we were potentially grandparents. And uh, we, we are not. But uh, it was a big to-do between his girlfriend's parents and and Cameron and it was it was a pretty pretty heated thing but uh I told my son I said now I realized that what's done is done but do you have any idea how you've complicated everything for not only yourself but your girlfriend and her parents because she's supposed to be starting college they're graduate she's graduating from school going away and my son's not going to college he's learning this so her parents have always been, you know, they're professionals. 
and they raised other children that are one's a police officer that was in the military one is a physician and another one's a lawyer so they're pretty respectable careers and his girlfriend is going to school to be a veterinarian if i'm being honest i don't believe that that's what's going to happen i don't i don't i just don't see it happening nothing to talk against her or anything like that but i, I just don't see that happening but they see how i am when they met me and they see that we homeschool him and it's just like i think they look at him like they don't understand what we do like they have no idea what it is that we do and that doesn't make sense to them so they i thought they've always looked at him like he's not going to amount to anything and that's why another reason why dad's making sure he's going to be ridiculous because maybe that's details i'm going to keep out it's it's probably not good for me to talk about that now i'll, I'll bring it out later on promise but not tonight but i just want to make sure that he shows his girlfriend's parents that he'll make what they make in a year in a week together and he'll be able to do that consistently so there won't be any there won't be any need for concern for you know their kids being with someone that uh, doesn't go to public school and doesn't go to college because that's the route they put all their kids through they went through that too and okay that's fine but uh you're all working you know you're going to work and being told when you can go home and when you can take a vacation and this is the most this is the most you can make and maybe you might get a raise when you don't have to do that, who's really in a better position? And that's unfortunate. I mean, that was one of the things that I didn't like. And and when I found out that we were potentially grandparents, I'm thinking to myself, shit. Now we're chained to these people. <laughs> like, oh man. I mean, I love her. I mean, she's wonderful, but her parents you, you just know as a parent, they see your son like he ain't good enough. Like that that's the vibe I got. So I'm I'm like, you know what? Listen, let me explain to you, Cameron, how this should never be a factor for you to worry about. Because it it, it wore on him in a while in a little while, you know, hearing from her father, questioning like what's he gonna do with his life, where is he going? Why didn't he finished school in a public school and is he going to go to college and what, what kind of degree is he going to get in? He's like, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to do what my dad does and that's where I'm going to go in life. And when you don't understand what it is that we do, it doesn't make any sense, right? Like, do you ever try to explain to someone what you're trying to do or what you do? It doesn't make any sense to them. Like, what? what? How, can, how can you do that? Isn't it gambling? Like, how can you be consistently able to to do that well you're seeing how it's consistent right it starts by reading price action which is how i teach that's the mentor in me that's how i teach my students to learn how to read price action consistently and if you manage yourself and you're able to keep yourself composed well using sound money management then you stand the chance of being successful consistently but all those factors need to come together like you can't just have one one piece of it. They all have to come together in a perfect, well, 100%, all factors moving in the same direction. So, if I'm being honest with you, I wish I wouldn't have brought up the whole thing about, <laughs> about almost becoming a grandfather and all that other business. I know she doesn't listen to these things and I know her parents don't listen to this either, but uh, my wife and I have been dying to have a conversation with them because they were very upset when they thought she was, and she's not. They've had multiple tests on. She's she's not. She's she's protected, and he was protected. But you just know, you know. I mean, whoever marries my daughter isn't going to be good enough. I know that. But I'm also the same guy that Cameron's my son. And for another man, regardless of who his daughter is, for him to think 
he's not good enough pisses me off. I'm going to be real honest with you. It pisses me off. So now I'm motivated to be like, you know what? I want you to earn enough money where when it comes time to when he asks you, you can say, listen, let me just show you. And we ain't got to have any conversation about it no more. And then boom, sit down and make what he makes in a year, in a week. And then all the conversations are over. No ego. It just stomp that shit out immediately. But I didn't tell him like that. I'm talking like that because it's in me to get it out of me because I want to vent. I've been chewing on that shit for a week and it's pissing me off. Like I want to go over there and have a conversation with him and his wife and say, hey, look, you know what you said to Cameron and how you talked to him and stuff. I understand. But you you knew this was going on, too. And. I don't know. Maybe this is a conversation. <laughs> like I said, I shouldn't be having these conversations, but maybe some of you all are loving this too. But you know, it's just, I'm a real person, you know, and I have kids, I have things that's going on in the real world, like all of you. Okay. And it was weird to have that near miss. Well, maybe it was I, I, not a near miss, but a, uh, a potential total trajectory change in my own personal life and my son's personal life and his girlfriend's life. They're too young for that. You know, way, way, too, way too young for that shit. And my wife would be spending all the money on everything for this kid. <laughs> we, we, we would be wanting, uh, well, not wanting, she'd be wanting to be buying everything and wanting the kid to be over here all the time. And it, it would just be a totally different experience here. And while I'm not against being a grandfather and I'm looking forward to it, I'm not, I realize how ill-prepared I am. I don't want to be one yet. So I might be 50, but I ain't Papa that much. So but anyway, I just uh, feel like I, I've covered a lot of things tonight, hopefully that were useful to you. But the last part of this stuff, this is more of a personal thing to let me get it off my chest. And I appreciate you listening to it. If you ever had that experience where, you know, maybe one of your children either got pregnant or got themselves in a situation where they got their girlfriend in trouble and it was dramatic for you, you know, give me a heads up on Twitter. Let me know about it because I, I never, I never contemplated what it would feel like. Like I just, I thought it was like years away, even with my older kids. But if, if it's going to be anybody that does it, it's going to be Cameron. Like he, he is, he is a young me all over again, but much more respectful. And uh, I, I wasn't respectful when I was younger, when I was learning all this stuff, I was very stupidly arrogant and I'm trying very careful not to do those things. And it may not sound like that's what I'm doing. Cause I said, I'm going to teach him how to do this. And then if his girlfriend's asking or parents ask, you know, how are you able to, live and what are you doing like <laughs> look at it this way okay um caleb was able to show like 2200 dollars in three days doing very very little with the same model too just a little bit now i know that's more money than cameron's girlfriend's parents make together a week I know that her father's an electrician and his mother, I'm sorry, her mother is a nurse, a hospice nurse. And just in three days, that's enough money right there to say that, look, if I just did the next two days, I'm, I'm killing what you both do. And if Cameron can duplicate that, and if that's all he ever amounts to be able to do, he's still winning. And that's that's where I'm pushing his attention because you know, sitting down telling him like, hey, look, you, you can parlay this up into this, 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 this. I'd be feeding him all the wrong motivation. So what I'm telling him to do is focus on trying to make six figures a year. If you just focus on six figures a year after taxation, it's still a comfortable living. 
You're doing better than the average person in America. It's way above the median income. And you have all the time to do whatever you want to do. If you want to make it bigger, you can do that. If you want to just live there and not do anything more than that, and you're comfortable with that, and that's all you want to put into it, that's fine too. I, I'm not going to worry about you. And that's all I want to be able to do is lay my head down at night and know that my kids are not going to have to lean on me to bail them out because something bad's coming in the future. You know, the economic you know, upheaval and all kinds of other dumb stuff that everybody else is worrying about. And I'm trying to prepare all of you to be resilient from falling victim to. I'm trying to do that with all my kids. And my two older ones are just not falling in line with it. It's, it's just, it doesn't make any sense to me. One's depressed because he's got his money tied up. And I have the money to replace that. But he has not changed his perspective on crypto. If he had more money, he'd pour more money into it, he said. And to me, I know I'm not going to give him money because that's what he's going to do with it. So that's the reason why I don't bail him out. So I keep him in that. He's paying credit card payments on the money he borrowed that he put into that shit that he's locked up in. He can't get his money out of it. So <laughs> what is a mentor to do? What is an what is an ICT to do in these in this condition or this situation rather? Just like the rest of y'all. I got kids and I got a family and I'm trying to make the best of it. And you might have the answers, but if your kids don't want to listen, what are you going to do? You can't make them do it. They're going to do it or they're not going to do it. And when they're adults, they have the ability to say, hey, dad, I appreciate you, but no. <laughs> and I don't like hearing them be able to tell me as an adult, no. I'm used to hearing them say, yeah, dad, okay, I'll take care of it. Thank you. Now they're adults and they can tell me, no, dad, I'm not doing that. So I counter that in chess by telling them, then stay where you're at financially because I'm not going to change it for you. And admittedly, Cody had a little case of the ass for a little while and we didn't talk for a couple months because his idea was, you know, you should give it to me because you have it. And I told him, you shouldn't have got yourself in that situation because I told you that would, that's what was going to happen. And if I bail him out of that and he doesn't feel the pain, of it, he's just gonna. He's already told me if I give him more money, he's just gonna pour more money into crypto. That, that, that's not. That's not what I want to do. I want him to learn how to trade something outside of crypto, and he ain't trying to do it. Why? Because he's depressed. He's depressed about the whole situation, and a girlfriend of his and and they broke up and it, it's weighing on him. And when I talk to you all about how, you know, when you have issues in your personal life and you have a separation or a breakup or a divorce, or you lose a spouse or lose a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a child, something traumatic happens. You can't take that into the marketplace. And I taught on that because I saw that in my son, Cody, when he and his long-term girlfriend separated and then she got with someone that was really well-to-do, had his life together, house and everything, and a police officer. And they already have three kids real quick. I think it hurt him. And since then, he's been depressed. And it's just, he, he it's a physical depression. It's not like, yeah, well, you know, I just don't feel up to it. Nick, you can see he's feeling it. I think he knows he he let her go. And it was a matter of him pushing her away. And he doesn't show any signs of being able to cope with that. I mean, he's dated other girls since then. But you can see he's made financial decisions trying to do what? Cope. Replace that depression with winning. And by betting on stupid shit. And it didn't pan out. So when I was teaching to you how that is an issue. I was reaching into my own personal family and Cody's experience. Now, Cody's not aware of it. He doesn't know that I'm talking about it, but it's helpful to all of you. And it's also therapy for me because I know I have to stick to my resolve about this because 
he's not in the proper state of mind that me throwing more money at him is not going to fix it because he's not going to do the right things with it. So I let him stay right in this position right now. So that way, because he's already talking to me. He's like, you know, dad, I want to, I want to make some changes and this, that, and the other thing. He's coming around, which is what's required. Everybody has debt. You have debt, you got credit cards, you have a mortgage, you have car notes, you know, you gotta, you gotta pay for things. That's the way the world is. And by sparing my kids any of that, am I really teaching them anything? Fuck no, I'm messing them all up. That's how I got Cody in that situation, by throwing money at him. Oh, well, you know, dad's got me. I ain't got to worry about shit. Let me just do stupid stuff. Well, there you go. And I regret it. I wish I could go back and change it and never have done it. And then add that to a young man having a long-term relationship. And it fails because of his own actions. And then feeling like he gave the best thing in his relationship life. You know, that, that life partner that could have been with him still. He let it go. And I think it, it eats him up. Like, it's bad. It's, it's, you can't fix that. And when depression hits you and it's physical, it's just real hard to shake it. And every decision you make is not really clear-headed. And you don't want to do that when you're trading, which is the reason why I uh, mentioned all that stuff before. And I know some of you have things that you would never talk to me about or even mention on social media, and you're hiding. It's in your closet, these these things that you know made mistakes in your life. And those are the very things that you're going to allow, if you're not careful, to derail you, mess you up, not be profitable, wreck your account pursue stuff emotionally instead of following a model. That's an unfolding truth. That's something that happens. It ain't just the, well, it only happens to me or only happens to you. That's what happens to everybody. In those circumstances, that's always the outcome. But you feel like you're the exemption. You're not going to be the person that that happens to. When you're probably going to be the centerfold, the perfect example of that. By definition, if we looked it up, you would be in the case study that that makes the perfect example of explaining this is what you should not do. That's how it typically ends up. But you don't feel like you're going to be the statistic. You feel like you're going to be exempt from it because it's you and you're different. And then when you go into the marketplace and you recklessly plow into it, hoping to get some kind of resolve or distraction by winning, knowing full well that that win wasn't really a byproduct of your model. It's just because you impulsively gambled. No different from pushing a button on a slot machine at the casino or laying down some chips at the roulette table. That's a gamble. So you don't want to do those things. You want to see what I'm doing teaching you how to see it, read it, be bored by it. And then like a business, you know, when, when people are running a business, they're not hopping around, you know, all excited because they're conducting business today. They're, they're not doing that. They're very methodically doing the same thing that's boring to them. You do this, you do that, you stay organized, you do your books, you pay your taxes, and this is the end of the year, and you can carve out a salary. It's boring. That's how you want your trading. You want your trading just like that. It's not going to cause you sleepless nights. It's not going to be something that you have to stress over. It's a business. You know what you're looking for. You know how to anticipate these things repeating, and you know when you're going to engage and take on the risk. You're not allowing your personal life. You're not allowing the things that would make you feel insignificant or inferior, or you need a bump in your feel-good dopamine. You're not going to try to get that through your trading. You're trading and pushing the button because there's something that your model says that this is a high probability, low-risk opportunity, and you're going to engage it. And you're going to manage it until it's over. And when it's done, you close the charts and you turn it off and you walk away and you go to the next session or the next trading day. Repeat. That's discipline. That's running it like a business. And you're fortifying it and protecting it from any outside stimuli.
no reason to try to replace a bad feeling away from trading. Trading is an island of, of itself. You don't let any of your personal stuff into that. You don't let other people in your relationships into your trading. You don't invite their analysis. You don't invite their opinion of what you've done. Your results are yours. Your spouse sees it at the end of the year. That's the best way of doing it. The best way. But isn't, isn't it hiding it from your spouse? No, you just tell them, I'm running a business. At the end of the year, I'm hopefully going to show you what I was able to do with this. If I show you every day or every week, your response to what I think is either good or not so bad, I may see this response that you give me, and it may affect me adversely. And then every trade I take will have that same impact of regret or remorse because I have shown you something that maybe didn't live up to your expectation, but you're not trading. You're just my partner. You're my spouse. You're my life partner. So you don't invite them into that. Be honest and say, I'm running this. This is what I'm doing. But you keep them out of it. Because two minds in this is toxic. You're never, ever, ever, <laughs> you're never going to be able to, to be comfortable with that. When you do well, if you show your spouse and they don't feel the same you know, excitement of, of what you were able to accomplish, what are you going to feel? Wow, they didn't, they didn't see it like I did. They don't appreciate me. You know how much effort it took for me to do this and how hard it was? They're never going to understand it, so don't tell them. At the end of the year, there's your results. There it is. At the end of the next year, I'll show you my results again, and we'll pay taxes on it, and we get to live off the fat. There it is. That's the best way to do it. You're not hiding it. You're just saying, look, I don't want to have any mental baggage. I don't want you to influence me. I don't want you to make me feel like I got to do better. And I don't want you to feel like I didn't do good enough. And if you're honest with your partner, wife, husband, whatever it is that you're with, if you're honest with them like that, that's the best way to ring in what you're doing as a trader. You're honest with them. You're going to confide in them when it's time to pay the taxes. I hear I'm, I'm going to show you what I was able to do. You're not hiding it from them, but you're being honest because it's a very psychological impact. When you let someone else that you love give them their opinion about or report card. In a lot of ways, I'm thankful that my wife is just like, well, you know, it's a video game. All of you people play video games. That's all it is. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Great. I, that, that's easy. It's it's disarming. I ain't got to worry about it. And frankly, you know, when I do something right in this, as a woman that's not really interested in it, she's never going to see this like you would see it or I would see it. Well, yeah, that was really precise. Look at that. That was very little drawdown. Look how fast it went down. Like we can appreciate that. My wife, not so much. So if you know that that's likely in your personal relationships, don't invite it. That's not bad. It's not hiding it and being surreptitious. It's better. It's better for you not to invite the adversities that can come into it. Because they're not going to make you take a trade because you told them unless they tell you, oh, well, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not really interested in that or not saying that, but the expression on their face when you show them your result and they're not impressed. Believe me, a man, we know what that looks like. We know what that looks like when you ladies say, oh, it's, that's nice. That means, oh, I really don't give a shit. <laughs> what, what are you showing me that for? I don't care about that. But they're being polite by saying, oh, that's, that's nice. We can read that in our ladies, our women. We can see that in them. But we, what you don't realize is, and men, you probably maybe not, haven't spent that many hours thinking about how you're going to do this when you finally get with someone, if you're single. But you didn't account for how that's going to impact you. And then when you take your next trade and it is approaching your stop loss, you're thinking, man, 
if she really wasn't all that impressed when I had that win, which I felt was great. And she asked me how I did today, or she reads it on my face that I took a stop and I'm draw down. I'm going to feel really worse. Let me just get in here and fix this right now. Right there, you just opened up the opportunity for you to do what? Wreck your account. Who's trading the account now? Retail Rick. The gambler. The gambler's in control. You slip seated with Retail Rick. And the analyst is left home. And Shotgun is the, the trader. At the mercy of wherever Retail Rick steers the car. Because now you've invited someone else to call the shots about your trade and how you feel about it and how you're going to react to the adverse respect or adverse react results. And in that aspect, you're going to take that whole emotional stimuli and direct your next series of trades. Not because you're following the model, not because you're doing the right thing with your trading model and risk management. Now you're trading for a outward response to something that probably isn't really going on, but in your head it is. You're afraid that you're not going to be able to be able to present with details and results to your spouse when they ask. And they might not ask, but you're afraid they're going to now. And you're going to wear it on your face and they're going to ask you now, what's wrong? What did you do? Well. You know your wife, <laughs> you know your husband, they know you, they know what you did, you know, they know you're troubled and you don't want to lie to them because that compounds it. Then you have to tell them what, what you don't want to tell them. <sighs> I was thinking about what I showed you the other day, which I felt really good about, and you didn't really show any kind of interest in it. And you kind of like dismissed it as it really wasn't a big of a deal. So now today when I was trading, I didn't do as well as I should have. And then I tried to fix it. And then I created more problems because I didn't want to have this conversation that I'm having with you right now. And now I want to go back in there and over leverage everything and just go full fucking forward and just go in and, and, and risk it all. Cause now I'm just angry at everything. How about that? <laughs> I've done that before. I've done that before. And unfortunately, um, it, it causes a, a great deal of animosity, not for the spouse, but for you as the trader, because you know you let yourself become unraveled. And it's so easy to see the very moments where you could have took control and said, no, but you don't. Why is that? Because you're allowing motion, the emotions, the things that are external to your trading, you're making that. The driving factor in your decisions on when and how you're going to trade. And that is what causes you to blow up. You're trying to invite other people to run your business. Your spouse is your spouse. They're not your CEO. They're not your boss. This is your trading business. Unless they're trading the account with you, they're not employee. They're not boss. They're not co-partner. They're outside of the company. Period. They're no different than your wife being your wife, your husband being your husband, and the company you work for right now, they have no place in that company. They can't go there, have a say in how the business is ran in the same way with your trading. That's how it's got to be. That's how it has to be. And some of you think, well, you know, I'm going to start this with my partner with my spouse and we're going to do this and we're going to do I mean, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, unless you are the freaking extreme exemption, which I can't even imagine where that even exists because two minds about money are rarely ever on the same page. If you look at where divorce is, usually, you know, well, it's the catalyst for divorce. It's number one, infidelity. And why is infidelity? Because you're not happy in the house. Somebody's not doing what they're supposed to be doing or somebody's doing extra that they shouldn't be doing. 
And the other reason why there's divorce is it's money. So right away, you're inviting an issue that would probably never be a factor if you just listened to me and said, listen, we're going to run a, a business in trading. I'm the CEO. I'm the chief executive officer. I am the president of the company. I am the sole proprietor. I'm Mr. Everything. Or I'm Mrs. Everything. In deference to the ladies that want to do it. But at the end of the year, we'll discuss what was done. And then we'll, at that time, discuss how we will spend the proceeds. That's where you invite the spouse back into the conversation. That's just the way it is. But during the business operations, she's not invited and he's not invited to the board meetings. You're not a board member. And that's how you manage it. That's how you keep the marriage safe. That's how you keep the relationship safe. That's how you keep the emotions and the weight of the opinion of your loved one. Because as men, we can say, oh, well, I don't give a shit about what my wife thinks. She don't know nothing. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If my wife told me I had a trade that I felt good about and I showed it to her and she said, that's really not all that big of a deal. That would feel like a kick in the nuts to me because her opinion about me and whatever I do means something to me. So I'd never invite that. <laughs> I just, you know, peacock around. <laughs> I don't talk about it. I just let her know that I did it and she rolls her eyes and whatever. But that's how I manage it. I don't sit down and ask for her opinion because she doesn't give a shit. So I never invite her to the board meetings. You may not like this approach. If you have something better, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear it. But I've been around the block enough times and met with so many people that have tried this with their relationships and it has not been good. It's, it's not been good at all. And if you are going to be a husband and wife team, one of you have to be the CEO and the other person is there just for moral support. That's the only other alternative because two minds looking at this, they're not generally going to agree. I see an opportunity here. I don't know about that. What do you think about this? Oh, shit. There you go. You have a divided mind. Two minds risking the same capital that have a relationship, a family, a household to manage as well. I promise you, the male will bring in problems to that. structure. It may not be visible in the beginning, but it will manifest itself because we're wired to be like that. We're the caveman. We, we, we do these things. And we are more willing to take risks that the women aren't. Women are nesters. They're, they know that they have to take care of shit when it's time to take care of shit. Men I'll get around to it whenever the fucking where you get down to it. If I don't want to do it right now, I ain't got to do it. Don't tell me how to do my weekend woman. I'm going to do what I want to do, how I want to do it. And then she puts her foot down and says, this is the way you're going to do it. And there's a fight. And then he ultimately listens and has it done. But you can't have that in trading. Somebody has to know that they're the one that is making the decisions. And the other one is subordinate to that. Whether it be the male or the female, the husband or the wife, doesn't matter. But one of them is the chief executive officer, the president of the company, everything, the CEO, every, you're, you're the one. And the other one does everything to allow that partner to succeed. Cheerlead them on. Don't place any more stress on them than it needs to be. Let them talk to them when they want to talk about it. And be encouraging all the time. And ladies, if you're listening, I can tell you as a male, that's how you encourage your husband. 
That's how you keep him doing it for the right reasons. You let him do it. You give him space. But you encourage him and you don't pry. So what did you do today? Let him tell you. Trust me, if he's done well, you're going to know all about it. And if he doesn't want to talk to you about it, chances are he's probably in drawdown. He's going through something. Let him talk to you when he's wanting to talk to you. Because if you start asking questions, it's going to make that even worse. And he's going to go right back to his computer. He's going to go right back to his account. And he's going to try to fix it so that way he doesn't have to feel uncomfortable in front of you in your eyes. Gentlemen, give me an amen if you know what I'm talking about and you've been there. Because that's exactly how we wreck ourselves through our family, through our relationships, even if the relationship is healthy. That's how it sneaks in. That's exactly how it creeps in and overtakes you. Because you don't want to look like a failure in the eyes of your loved one. That's your life partner. You chose to be with that person. For life, maybe brought children into the world. And you don't want to look like you don't care enough about your finances or why you're doing it. When it's normally just, that's a loss. It's drawdown, big deal. And if he tells you, hey, I took a loss today. It's okay, honey. You'll get it back. You don't need to rush to get it back either. You'll be fine. Easy. Encourage, say little, let him do most of the talking. If he doesn't want to talk, leave it just like that. And you will not inspire him to feel like he has to fix it and just go about your business. Run your household the way you normally would do. Because if you give this gentleman any more reason to feel like he has to put out a fire when there ain't one, he'll start one. And then everything unravels very quickly. And many times I've had students that because they short-circuited and lost the money that they had invested, then problems started between them because of the animosity of the husband lost control. The spouse did not support him as he would wanted to see her support him. And he used that as an excuse to go in there and be reckless. And then held a grudge against her for being upset that he was reckless and lost their money. And then a divorce. So it's much, much more than blowing your account or losing your funded account if you are married. If you're going into this with two minds, the other person in that relationship is not a board member. And they have to understand that they're not a board member. You're benefiting by the proceeds and gain that this company presents at the end of the year. But you're outside of it. And you're a cheerleader for the one that's running it. You don't get in the way. You don't try to say what we're going to spend the money on while you're still earning it throughout the year. You earn it for the year, and then you sit down as a, as a partnership in the marriage. Because now you've taken income out of it. How are you going to spend it? Then you sit down and say, now you're a board member of the marriage. How do we spend this money and both be happy about it? That's how you manage this. That's how you do it. If you have children, I'll say this, and I'm going to end it. If you have children that are under 17, you can pay them each year, and they don't have to have any uh, income taxes taken from that. You have to start a, a, an LLC to do that. Uh, I, I recommend an S-Corp, but you talk to your accountant and find out. If you're in the States, it's S-Corp. But uh, if you have adult children, you can set up a family management LLC where you can pay them basically a gift each year and you pay it through the LLC and they don't have to pay taxes on that income and let your, in, you let your accountant tell you all this stuff, but it will uh, allow you to transfer money into them, into their hands. And uh, they don't have to pay taxes on all that stuff. And they can also write off 
expenses against that. But you have to let your accountant tell you all that. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a tax preparation person. I'm just telling you, you go talk to someone that can tell you do all those things. But there's so many things you can do once you set this up as a business and it's profitable. Like you, you can do a lot of things that you as an employee at the job you're working right now, you don't have any advantages to that. Like your health benefits. You know, I don't, I don't personally have health insurance because it's too exorbitant. Even though I have lots of money, I refuse to pay the Obamacare bullshit that they put in place. I'll pay for whatever I got to pay for when I get sick. I don't give a shit. I ain't worried about it. I ain't paying deductibles that, or not deductibles. I ain't paying all these high premiums for something I'm not needing to spend money on. But eventually, because I'm now 50, I have to now start thinking about that because you know, what happens if I fall you know, ill to something? You know, like um, multiple sclerosis is in my in my family. Uh, diabetes is in my family. Heart disease and cancer is in my family. God forbid in Jesus' name I have any of that stuff. Um, I'm healthy. I don't have anything wrong with me per se. Um, but any any time you know in these years right now, that can change. You know, something can happen, and boom, you know, I find out I have something that's you know I have to contend with, and it would be a high expense issue. Well, if you were working at your job, you have to have health insurance and you pay for that through deductions in your weekly paycheck or biweekly, whatever you get paid. When you set up your LLC and you're making money, you can write off your expenses for health insurance. And everything you spend is a write-off on that. Your expenses for your cell phone, your automobile, insurance, gas, all those things. And if you make yourself someone online, like an influencer where you're seeing its image, you know, a portion of your clothing and things like that, all of your travel writes off, you know, hotel stays and travel expenses. You know, as long as you talk about or do business, you know, during the time while you're there, if you're working on vacation, that's permissible. And 50% of the things that you spend on restaurant and food is a write-off. But you don't have that as an employee. Like you don't have that benefit as an employee, which makes working for someone else stupid. So if you have this skill set, you learn how to do this and you're able to make money, un unless you are just foolish with money and you don't want to you know, do the right things, you need to incorporate yourself. Incorporate yourself. And if you start making a lot of money, you want to get like umbrella uh, umbrella policies that – you know, if you drive down the road, someone does the pull in front of you, hit the brakes, and then you rear-ended me. You know, you want to get an umbrella policy that protects you from being sued for a lot of different shit. Okay, and they're not terribly expensive. You know, I think like uh, I think like twenty eight hundred dollars, you can get like four and a half million dollars, five million dollars coverage from any kind of lawsuits or any kind of like that. It just it's done. It's handled. You got to worry about it. OK, and when you start building affluence and you have money, you have to protect your, yourself from that because there's ambulance chasers there out there all the time, all the time. They're always trying to get something from you. OK, and you preserve your your net worth by having these things in place, because if you wear your wealth, people will see it and they're trying to take advantage of it and try to take it from you. And there's ways to prevent all that stuff. and I have lots of conversations I can talk to you about that as we go through the year, but I want you to change your way of thinking about a lot of things, your relationships, because that's going to be impactful to your trading. I want you to think about how you run your work life and how you spend your money, what you spend your money on. All those things are factors on what's going to cause you to be impulsive about trading. If you manage your finances correctly, if you do the, th the right things with your money, you won't be so quick to be impulsive about pressing the button to get a feel-good moment because you'll be in a better position mentally because you have all your finances in, in the right place, all of the insurances in place, the protections, all the things that would cause the, other, the average person to be scared and always stressing out. Like I'm not worried about any of that shit. I'm not worried about nothing. 
Okay. I know, I know any given day something bad can happen, but I don't live my life worrying about that. I'm not going to go into the market to make myself feel good when it does. <laughs> I don't give a shit. I'm not worried about that stuff. But you, as someone that's now starting how to, to do all this stuff, if you start falling into success, you don't have that yet because you're going to be new money. And new money isn't generally organized. It's not prepared. Um, you are more interested in clout in showing up and showing out. And there's things that you should be doing to fortify yourself, protect yourself from other people trying to take what you have and victimizing you. So you want to be able to change your perspective on what it is you do in your personal life, your management of your marriage, your, your relationships, and allow this not to be a factor for impulsiveness or allowing that relationship to be toxic. And then because of that toxic relationship, staying with people you know you shouldn't be with. Are you in an abusive relationship? It can be on both sides, physically or emotionally. If you know that's not working, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it's, you can't fix it. And if you're trying to reside with someone like that, that is toxic. And you're going to be more inclined to do things impulsively to give yourself a distraction. Or if I can just make a little bit of money today, it'll remind me that this is the right thing to do and I won't be here long because I'm, I'm making money. You're doing something outside your model. You're letting something other than your model tell you when to press the button. And that is going to invite failure. You're going to blow your account. You're going to wreck yourself. All these things compound and you don't think about it when you first start getting into this because you think, oh, it's just, it's just trading. It's just pushing a button. It's so easy. It's up or down, you know, trading's easy, trading's easy, but you're listening to people that aren't making money. You're listening to people that are trying to be influencers and, and managing clout, social media, media engagement. And I'm not that kind of person. I'm telling you how to run your life like a corporation, run your life like a business, and run your trading like a business. All these things have to be in balance. Your personal life, your work life, and your financial decision making and your trading. That all has to be 100% moving in the same direction, not over here doing its own thing and over here doing it. And you're not letting anybody, even in your personal relationships, have a place in the decision making because if you do that you're not in control you will be impulsive you will be reckless you will be reacting emotionally to the stimuli that those relationships present everybody has a day where your spouse and you just you, you're not doing Things that would promote a calm environment, an argument of some kind, a, dis a disagreement. Everybody has that. Everybody has that. But it's typical for a man to take that out in the marketplace. If you're a trader, you get in an argument with your spouse. Like generally, our disagreements are my daughter, our daughter. Okay, her daughter biologically, but mine by marriage. But I raised her, so she's my daughter. And I want to see her do things, but I also know my place. But sometimes I say more than I should, and I say, this is what she should be doing, and I don't like the fact that you don't try to convince her that this is a problem for what she's doing and she shouldn't be doing that. And then she corrects me and says... No, I'm not going to do that. And I know without her saying so, it's not my place to say any more about it. And it's it's the truth. It's I'm not biologically her father. And she's an adult. She's her own person. 
but I'm also the guy that bails her out. <laughs> so I have a little bit of a horse in the race here. So I, I kind of like want to de you know, defend myself as much as I can. But I also know my place. It's I don't want to be too overbearing with it. And then that's usually the source of our arguments. OK, and when it happens, I'm frustrated because I know I can't breach that barrier that I'm not biologically her dad, even though she looks at me like that. And she respects me more than her biological father. I never press harder. So that stress is a real factor for me. But I don't go into the marketplace and say, I'm pissed off at my wife. I'm disappointed that my daughter's not doing what I told her to do. So I need to feel good about something. Let me go in there and over leverage the British pound. Because I need to distract myself. No, I don't do that. I don't do that at all. But what I do do is I go in to PlayStation and I play a particular round in Splinter Cell where I kill all the Russians <laughs> and I take it all out on them. And that's what I do. I, I go right there. I play that one round and I do it one time. It takes me 20 minutes and I feel good and it's done. That's my coping mechanism. If I don't have that, I probably would have gone into the marketplace. So you have to have some kind of hobby outside of trading so you can channel your energy, whether it be positive or negative energy. It might be the gym. It might be working out. It might be martial arts. It might be playing music or a musician, you know, some kind of instrument or something. It may be art. Whatever it is, you need to have something outside of trading so that way you can channel your energy and say, okay, I'm investing my time in trading. I'm investing my time in speculating. But once I'm done that, disconnect. Go do something outside of that. Reading, some kind of club, you know, um, hunt, whatever. I don't know, whatever it is for you. Uh, like that guy, Pat, he, he surfs. That's cool. I like looking at that. Uh, to me, I, I'm, I'm waiting for a fucking shark to come up out of there and grab his ass up one time. I hope it doesn't happen, Pat, but I'm just expecting that shit all the time when I see people surf. I, I'm not going to do that. I love it, but I'm not going to do it. But uh, you have to have a hobby. Somebody has to you know, be able to draw your attention away from the markets and you not feel like you're going to suffocate because you don't have your lifeline connected to the marketplace. And I had a long period of my time as a younger man where everything was that. There was this umbilical cord, this oxygen, you know, like a scuba diver. Like it was my air supply. I had to constantly have my quote trek. I had to constantly be talking about the marketplace. I had to constantly be able to see it. If I was visiting other people and I didn't have my quote trek with me, I would ask them, hey, can I turn on your cable network and see what you know, the financial news network said, which is CNBC now, but you know, that I had to see what the ticker tape said. Every 10, 11 minutes, it would go about, you know, I would say, okay, here's S&P, here's bonds, you know, here's whatever market I'm looking at. That's not normal. I never had a chance to unplug. You have to schedule that. You need to do that in the beginning. So that way it keeps balance in your life. And it won't be like it was for me where it was everything this. Relationships suffered. Children, relationships suffered. Everything, my personal health, my fitness, everything. Everything was second to this. The markets were my God. It was my religion. It was my everything. And I was offended that other people didn't respect it like I had respect for it. And I was offended with my own family members when they asked me to spend less time with it and spend more time with them. That's not normal. That's not balanced. And that is not proper for a household or a family to run efficiently and everyone feel like they're doing their part. And unless you schedule it in the beginning and you run your life and your trading business like that in the beginning, it's real easy to get obsessive with it. Even if you're not an obsessive person, when you start making money, it changes you and you want more of it, especially if you never came from money. It makes you feel like that's your whole purpose and, and that's, your, that's who you are. And without that, you're nothing when that's not true.
which is the reason why you have to have something outside of trading, outside of your marriage too. You have to have some kind of outlet that is not trading. And whatever that is, you need to make sure that you're doing that away from the marketplace and not thinking about, I got to get back to charts. I got to get back to trading. If you're carrying your phone around while you're doing that other thing, or you're out with your spouse or significant other, and you're constantly looking at your phone, what's trading view? What's the, what's the market saying right now? That's not healthy. That, that's not healthy. And that's how it started with me. And all of a sudden, it'll overtake every moment of your life. And you're a slave to it versus mastering it. You want to be the master of it. You're the CEO. You are Mr. Everything, Mrs. Everything. You're the corporation. You run the show. You call the schedule. When are you working? When you're not going to work. But if you let the money become your master, you're going to slave for it all the time. And you're not going to be happy no matter how much you make. It won't be enough. It won't ever be enough. No matter how much money you make, when you fall victim to it like that, you are never satisfied. You never feel a sense of accomplishment. And you always feel like it's not enough. And you want to do what? Pour money, pour money, pour money into the marketplace. Why? Because that's the report card. And when you make it and you get profits, it's not enough. So what are you going to do? More of it. Which means your family's going to suffer. They're going to see less of you. And I was a ghost in my own home for years. They seen me. Yep, and I'll talk to you in a couple of minutes. That's a lie. Hours later, I'm still in there looking at shit. Trading this and trading that. I'm done. I come out. Everybody's sleeping. And I walk through their house. And I would watch them sleep. That's a lonely feeling. When I would repeat that over and over and over again. And I would tell myself out loud, I can't do this. Like I got to stop and stop trading and focus on them. I got to spend more time with them. And I could literally see them growing up, laying in their bed, faces changing, becoming you know, teenagers. And reminding myself, I've said this so many times, but my obsessive compulsive disorder fed into, I got to keep doing that. And you don't realize it, but you lose time. A couple months becomes a year and a year becomes several. And all of a sudden, now they're adults. And you can't call that time back. You missed it. You wasted it. You blew it. And that's one of the things I hope that you listen to me with because I know I can make you successful. That that's a, that's a given. I know I can, but you have to give yourself permission and the time to get there. But the ones that will do it, they'll still mess up by doing the things that I did because you get too ingrained with trying to make more when it's enough. What is enough? You have to determine that for yourself. But whatever that is, once you hit it, you stop. Then you spend time with your family. Do something outside of the marketplace, your hobby, whatever. Have a life. If not, I promise you, you'll be like these weirdos that's online that are constantly on social media. They're not with their own families. They're talking shit about everybody else. They ain't even proven they're profitable. They're going to sue everybody. <laughs> you don't want to be that. Okay, you, that's not what you want to be. You want to be happy. You want to be able to be uplifting to not only yourself, but other people that know you and your family members. And you want to be successful. That's that's living. That's that's the purpose of living is to help other people be fruitful in their life, and you be a catalyst to help them do that. That's that's what the that's why we're here. That's exactly why we're here. We're not here to shit on another person, tell them that they're not good enough or not as good as you are run around telling everybody you know you're better than they have more money than the accounts and bullshit you know that's that's dumb and people that really have money they don't go around doing that that's somebody that doesn't have money 
And when you're young, you think you want to go out there and do that and flex on everybody. And nobody will care when you do it. They'll have less respect for you when you try to do that stuff. So don't even start, don't, don't even start it. Keep your mind on running your own business and mind your own damn business. Don't worry about anybody else. Whatever happens, happens. Always be in a position where you're prepared as best as you can and have a game plan and stick to it. And in my opinion, everything I've talked about tonight is how I teach my children. Like these are the life lessons I learned. These are the things that I learned to to get myself prepared for balancing my marriage when I wasn't balancing it well. Um, I'm thankful that I'm aware of it now. I wish I was more aware of it earlier. Like I wish I would have been more aware of it 26 years ago. But 26 years went by like that. And it's very much a source of regret for me. Despite being successful, despite being where I am, I'm not happy with the way I put my family aside to do everything that I did to be where I'm at now. Because it's hard. It's hard to to articulate what it feels like when you can't be satisfied as a young man wanting something you can't have, which is the acceptance and approval of a loved one that they are gone. So you have to do what? You replace it with something you attribute to equal or more value. And that was image. That was money. That was me becoming inner circle trader. That was me being you know, who you know me as. And listening to people and transforming people's lives like I've been so blessed and fortunate to be able to do is the only source of worth for having done it the way I did by not spending the time with my wife and my children like I should have. It's not hard to understand how much time I spent away from them, even in the same house. Look how much I'm still talking to you right now. I don't owe you a damn thing. But my heart and my spirit feels like I want to pour out into all of you all the time. You're not talking to me. I don't hear you. I bet I know you're listening. I know that you're hearing me, and I know that most times I'm hitting the right buttons. Because I lived all this stuff. I have went through it. And hearing the, the stories of people you know, finding success with it, seeing their faces lighting up when they're talking about it, like... That is healing for me because I punish myself every day for not being the father I should have been and not the husband that I should have been. Mr. ICT, yes, I know, that's me. But what about dad? Well, I failed there. What about husband? I fell short there. So when I see people share their testimony, not only is it comforting for me and it heals me, it gives me a reason to feel like it wasn't a total waste pursuing it because money's money, you know? But having an impact on other people's lives, that's, that's something you can't put a price tag on. And seeing the transformation and saw you 
like you see just the interviews that I've been putting up and I have more of them coming. But I have people that reach out to me all the time and so many of them don't want to do the interview. Like they don't want to show their face. They don't want to be in a position where other people can criticize them, ask them questions and pry into what they do and what they don't do and why they didn't do this and why did they choose this direction. And I can respect that. There's a lot of people that are in my private mentorship that are, you know, they all talk openly. They're, they're able to talk to one another and they'll say, you know, I don't want to do interviews, but they share their testimony openly in our community. And there's a lot of people that I've trained. I've never seen the face of, I've never heard their voice. And when I have the opportunity to see and hear my students and, you know, I get emotional about that because if I was to open up this right now and start talking to someone, whoever would be asking, and I'm not asking you to ask to talk to me because I'm not going to talk to you tonight. I will as we go further through the year, but it's not the same. Like it's not the same as seeing them face to face and then watching them describe what it was like while they learned this and their view of me as their teacher as someone that you know poured themselves into them and watching them explain what it's like for themselves right now and they're smiling they're wearing their joy like that is such an emotional thing for me i love it i feel refreshed when i see that i mean look it's one thing when you know it works it's wonderful but when you see someone's life completely changed for the better and they feel confident that they're going to be able to do this going forward, they know, they know what they're doing and nobody can take it away from them. They can talk all the shit they want about it. They don't care because they're successful now. They know how to ride that bike. And when you learn how to ride a bike, you don't forget it. And it's just a wonderful Wonderful opportunity for me to really nail down real people. For a long time, all I saw was usernames. FX, M21, you know, you know, whatever the fuck it was. <laughs> so many people were in that mentorship. And that's all I knew. A, a number, you know, that was all it was. And the reason why I did that is because everybody was asking for the same username and it was already taken. And they were like, well, what about this? And what about, I was like, man, fuck this. I'm just going to, here's your username. Here it is. It, that's it. And then it was also a watermark for people that were leaking it. So anyway, I can keep on going, but I've said enough tonight. I said I was going to stop talking a little while ago, but I just want you to know that there's a right way to do this. And there's a right way to start doing it, but you can deviate and make all kinds of mistakes that you won't recognize until it's too late. And you lose time with your family and loved ones. You develop toxic habits, impulsive gambling. All those things can creep in without you realizing until it's too late. And you have to be very diligent in the beginning on how you're going to proceed how are you going to manage yourself? Who are you going to allow to influence you? That's a big one. And it's a big one. And you don't really think about it. And you probably didn't think about it like I've talked about it tonight until now. Now you have something to you know, consider going into the weekend. You know, maybe you have to make some changes and some adjustments in your personal relationships and maybe your marriage and say, hey, look, um, Michael was talking about this tonight, and I want to be honest and let you know that I want to succeed. And are you comfortable with me doing this? And we only look at the end result at the end of the year, and that way I don't feel the pressure that you might be placing on me. Not that you're trying to do it, and not that I should be worrying about it, but when you cancel any opportunity for that, it allows you to be objective. And you need to be very objective about what you're doing, when you're doing it, how you're doing it with your model. 
you don't do those things in the beginning, it's real hard to to muster the uh, the discipline to start doing it later on because you get set in your ways. You're not going to be consistent. It needs to be in there in the beginning. And right now, you're just now learning how to read price. You're seeing how nice it is to be able to know what it's going to do. And think about that. That, that. That's absurd to be able to say something like that. We know what the market's most likely going to do. That's arrogant, isn't it? That's preposterous. How can anyone say that and mean it? And yet you see us doing it. Isn't that fun? Isn't that amazing? Think about it. All these big conglomerates, these banking institutions, these financial firms, Wall Street, they're all doing battle, worrying about the fluctuations of these markets. And here we are sitting down every day, measuring to the tick what they're going to do, when they're going to do it. Think about yourself for a second. You're just like me, an average Joe from wherever, small town USA. And we're literally doing with the Goldman Sachs boys, the UBS boys, don't know. Think about that. They're the movers and shakers in the industry. And it's noise to them. <laughs> I don't know if that gets my rocks off. I love it. I love it. And I love sharing it. I love seeing everyone's excitement when they see it unfold. And it's just hugely motivating. Because otherwise, I'm not really impressed by it. I mean, I, you see it so many times for so many years. It's just like, oh, whatever. And I fall in love with it all over again because I get to live vicariously through all of you when you have that epiphany, that moment of astonishment where the veils pulled back and you see it for the first time. I remember what that felt like. And I get to relive it every single time a student says, holy shit, I can see that. And there it is. It's done. And I get the smile on my face aches because I'm reliving that moment all over again. And I don't feel 50 anymore. I feel 20. And it places me just like a time machine right back in that moment. And it's fun. It's just really such a blessing to have so many of you having that experience and sharing it with me and sharing it with everyone else. It's a motivation that, you know, I never really thought too much about it. Didn't feel a need for it because I was really working too hard to keep this shit going and teaching. But more people over the years asked for it. It's like, hey, look, can you create a way for us to talk to you and tell tell you what our story's like? And I was like, yeah, well, you know, whatever. I didn't have time for it, really. Making lessons for mentorship and managing different user groups and kicking people out that were fucking leaking it. It's too much, too much stress. Now, like I promised, you know, once I got done with that part of it, I would be able to return back to a little bit more relaxed approach to teaching and I, i'm really enjoying it like I'm, I'm i love i love teaching it i love sharing it i love showing it live because it's nothing better than it and when you all get a chance to see it and handle it for free it's disarming isn't it like you didn't cost anything you just show up and see does this person really know what the fuck he's talking about? <laughs> and then when you watch it, it's like, whoa, wow. And you start seeing my other students doing really well. I mean, think about it. What's $100,000 to you? What's $200,000? What's $300,000 to you? Maybe when you first started messing around with this stuff, you didn't think about those numbers. You were thinking, well, if I could just make $1,000 a week or a couple times a month, make 200, uh, 200, 
not 200 but like two twenty five hundred dollars or so you know that'd be awesome get me my payout you know try to make my ends meet get my ends up now you're hearing and seeing students throwing big league numbers around <laughs> All from a guy teaching with demo. It's interesting, isn't it? But anyway, I'm going to get off here and go see my wife before she falls asleep. And then I'll have to hear about it tomorrow if I don't. <laughs> you said you was only going to be down there for an hour and a half. Let me see what time it is. I started at 7 o'clock. It's freaking four, four hours. How about that? Like, it's this is the typical ICT Twitter. Four hours. I don't usually do that. They're still listening to me. I don't know how to do that, to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to do it. It just seems like uh, there's a bunch of you still here. So, But hopefully you got something out of this tonight. I hope you had some fun hanging out with me. Uh, I, this is going to be, obviously, the, the Saturday shotgun. I've done it all on one, one clip here. Uh, I know I say I don't plan on doing anything tomorrow and I'm quite certain I won't be on social media so don't look for any kind of tweets from me because I'm going to be working with my son and in, in, you know in private and such because I have to make sure he stays motivated because today was a little bit harder than it needed to be for him, I think but um, enjoy your weekend study and we'll be back at it again Lord willing on Monday so I'll talk to you then be safe